They said, JT, I don't even feel good, bro. Yeah, I bet. And I'm like, but he tried to kill you. I know, bro, but I don't feel good, bro. I thought once I got him, I'd feel better. Yeah, it's not going to cure it. Bro, that blew my mind. And then another dude, they tried to kill him. He got to kill, you know, got to kill right. the guy, right? JT, I, bro, I can't sleep. So, so, JT, are you saying right here, right now, that you're responsible for Tupac's death? I didn't know the politics of how the South run. There was some bad videos put out that JT hate Mexicans. Oh, I saw those JT. I was going to brush you when I saw If you. we going to kill each other, let us do it. But don't you be an instigator. Hi, everybody. You guys know what it is. The one and the only the American Troll podcast broadcasting live directly from North Hollywood, California. My name is Gail and I am the American Troll. I got another banger for you people, man. Our next guest is an American rapper, recorder, I mean, record producer, and record executive from Fillmore, San Francisco, Califas. Please give a warm welcome to the one and only JT, the bigger figure. Yeah. Oh. Hey, what's happening? What's up, JT, homie? Man, happy to be here, man. man. Looking good, looking fly, homie. Hey, man, I'm trying to represent my city. I knew I was coming. Man, you, bu <laughs> you busting eyes over here, homie. Hey, I knew, but I, what I knew, it will be fair. Oh, absolutely, homie. Imbalanced. And fair and balanced, homie. <laughs> now, believe it or not, there's there's a there's a lot of Frisco fans down here in Southern California. Homie. Yeah. There is a lot, man. I was asking my man, I say, is there do, do they wear the 49ers down here? He said no. <laughs> well, no. During the games, yes, brother. During the games, it's almost a sea of red at the at the Rams games. Okay. But All but, right. but that's because the season holders of the Rams, what they do is they sell the tickets for more money to the Frisco friends. Ah, that's what's going on. That, that's how they get you, man. Okay. That's how, so let's say, okay. let's say if it's a regular Rams game, they'll sell it to us for like two fifty. When Frisco comes on, it's like selling dope to a white person, homie. Yeah. They double, triple up. They double and tripling up. <laughs> you want this ticket? You need two. <laughs> that's just how it is, player. That's but no, man, hey, man, it's a pleasure having you, man. Thank you for pulling up over here, brother. Yes, sir, brother. Uh, so let's just get this started, man. Where were you born okay. and raised at? I mean, I was born and raised San Francisco. Filmo District, um, my mother Pearl, my father George, you know, uh, two unique individuals came together, had me. Um, I began uh, my early years in music, just enjoying um, moms playing music on Saturdays. What's she know? playing? She was playing the Gap Band. She was playing Ooh. Marvin Gaye. She was playing Michael Jackson. That's when that's when music was uh just uh that much better, right? Yes, she was playing Stevie Wonder. You know, like, and that's my earliest uh, memory of the music and what got in me Saturdays cleaning up the house and the music always was the premier thing that started everything off. Once the music come on, everybody you know, know you got to get up and it's time to clean. <laughs> hey, Saturday. That's the exact same thing as Latinos, Mexicans, uh, Central Americans. You, you hear the, the cumbias, you hear the Vicente Fernandez go on, and you know it's cleaning time in it's the morning. It's cleaning time in the morning. <laughs> hey, hey but, it, but it's good, right? You start feeling it, you start getting that's into right. it, and it, and it makes you go. The music always made it easier. So what, what's let's say what's one song that you hear that really reminds you of your mom's? Man, uh, Thriller, Michael Jackson. Thr thriller, huh? Yep, my auntie and them dancing, doing that dance. The little... <laughs> <laughs> that dance, that's... If, if, for a song for my mom, that's what I remember. That's what you remember, Thriller. I remember that song because it was so... It, they just played it over and oh, over yeah, and for over. Playing. You know, it was on the record back then. Well, even now, as soon as as soon as uh, as soon as October, like it's perfect. Actually, it's funny I asked you that because it's October, and that's when it kicks in with that song. That song kicked you're in. You're gonna man. hear it this month. So you've been thinking about Mama this month. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Because you know, it was a lot of other songs, but that is the song that, that stick you. out because I seen. I never saw my moms and them do dance routines, but they learned Michael Jackson. <laughs> Dance routine. Just for that and, one. Yeah, the thriller. That's right. Yeah, so. So when, when uh, JT was a, a young man, let's say in his, uh, I don't know, maybe like junior high days, what, what are you doing at this point in life? And how, and how also, how was the neighborhood you grew up in? Okay, first of all, the Fillmore District is a prominent black community in San Francisco. Um, when you say the word gentrification, this is the first place that they tested gentrification mm -hmm. to come in 
and move people out based on whatever terms and conditions that for the reason right. like people had houses and they made them move the houses to other areas they wanted that area my young days coming up it was unity amongst the people so i always felt a part of the community um the the music as a teenager you know early teen i would say coming into the run dmc the movie uh beat street oh, yeah. the other movie um crush groove you know, I think Crazy, Breaking was in there too. Breaking. Uh, those movies, in a young person mind, as is it is today, it made me feel like I might can do this or I want to be part of that. So my young, my young days was actually a lot of wanting to be part of that blueprint of this new thing. It's hip hop. It's, it's break dancing. It's spray painting your name on the wall. You know, graffiti of some sort. These things was intriguing, like the dancing on the corner. I remember the you know, uh, linoleum cost 50 cent a square foot back in 1986, 87. I don't know what it costs now, <laughs> but I'm just saying, yeah, yeah, if you want to sure. be a break dancer, you have to have your own little rollout thing. <clears throat> your gear, homie. To spin and do your thing, you know. So seeing that at my junior high school uh, as a young teen, and then the music mixed with this dance stuff, mixed with these new clothes coming out, you know, the hip hop clothes, Run DMC, got the Adidas, yeah. you know, you want a Kango uh, hat, all these different. Um, that had a big impact on me because as time went on, you know, I could see how I developed, but this the beginning. Yeah, of course. This the beginning. Like these are things that make you feel a certain type of way. And um, I just carried it with me, you know, uh, as far as, being a creative, um, being a fan of the movie Crush Groove, I learned that you could borrow $5,000 from somebody named JB. But as soon as your record starts selling, you're supposed to pay JB back. Absolutely. Before your artist sign with whoever that other, <laughs> them other people that came to get <laughs> said, we got a big check for you. Imagine, I remember this movie so detailed, wow. it made me want to borrow some money so that I can maybe start me something. Let me ask my cousin, let me get 2000 or 1500 for my studio time. These elements watching that movie, I grabbed that as a kid. And then hearing Too Short, you know, seeing, mm. well, I can't say I was seeing them because it wasn't music videos. And right. The, back, the, back the then. disc players, right? It wasn't even this yet. This was the I mean, cassette. The cassette source, right, yeah. All you could do was hear. And if he's in the magazine, you could see him in the magazine. Music videos didn't get going until about 88. You know what Too Short doesn't get a lot of credit for? And he had a lot of positive music with a lot of great messages, homie. To get out the hood, to there's his money in the hood, to just elevate your game. And I don't think Too Short ever really gets that. Everybody just thinks Too Short, bitch. But he, there's, <laughs> there, I mean, it is, right? But there's so many old school raps when I listen to Too Short. Because I still bump him all the time. Yes. And I'm like, oh, that's just gangster. And that's some back in the 80s, he was dropping gems on us, right? Yes, yes. Too Short, you know, his message... Always, I think, had the the foundation of the people. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, he was catering to the people. Even with the bitch concept, you know, being exposed to that pimping in Oakland, it's like, how can you not gravitate toward it? Right. Like, I'm not saying that's what you should do, but I'm saying that's from too short and how his, how his music has impacted us and the messages, not getting credit, but it made other people come along like me, younger dudes, Seeing him and I'm like, well, shit. He talking about getting money. He talking about having businesses. He talking about getting out the hood. Those, yeah. I, I could say yeah. that I grabbed some of that and took that with me. So you saw, you actually saw like the the positive part of the of the those movies, which was like you know break dancing, crush group, and all that. But you also were at a, a pretty prime age because we're pretty close in age. You saw what another movie could do and influence people in a negative. How did the movie Colors influence the base? 1988. There that go. that movie. That movie impacted our, our our neighbor. It impacted the whole country. Yes, the whole country and outside the country. Whoever saw that, and if you was black, you wanted to, you wanted to identify with your hood or your gang or your block. So it made everybody choose a block. I can remember after this movie, it wasn't that many weeks. It wasn't that many weeks or months after that movie. I began to see in my neighborhood Filmo. Fulton Street Mob, 
out of control posse, uh, knockout posse, Death Valley posse, Page Street mob. You feel me? Mm-hmm. These these names. That's what broke our neighborhood apart. Any conflict prior to the block breaking up after this movie Colors, because that movie made everybody be like, well, shit, I'm from right here. Right. Oh, well, shit, we from right here. It intensified that. So I definitely can say from the positive movies of just showing the lifestyle of this rap thing when it first started, they like, oh, you can influence some people with this. Nah, I think we can tell a different story. And that movie Colors, that was a reality, though, down here. Yeah, for sure. We didn't we didn't know how deep it go. Like I I wasn't aware. That movie made me aware. I was 14 years old. I did my first recordings of rap songs. That movie influenced um I want to say NWA first product that came out of course. Okay, that had an impact. Um I want to say Scarface. I want to say um E40. Because he came out in 88. Uh, right. I think, what was it, The Click or Mr. Flamboyant? I think it was Mr. Flamboyant, which was... So that was bumping The Click off your playlist. <laughs> see? That, that, those influences was like real-time influences. Like, I'm listening to music. This ain't no movie. But then movies, we could visualize how to be a better robber or a better gangster. shooter or a gangster. This is the new age gangster. You know, uh, it's colors involved. Yeah, somebody want to be Rocket, somebody want to be Looney Tunes. Somebody, yes. And, and we as kids started playing as that because the same These thing happened These different here. characters, you just, you you took the words out of my mouth. These characters became characters. Yes, <laughs> straight up. Somebody, you fit one of these guys down there in these movies. So um, I do want to say that after Colors and then coming into Juice, I think, which wasn't mm-hmm. too much farther after that, and then Boys in the Hood, and then Menace to Society. I mean, that started the thing of hood life glorified, right. even though it's supposed to be a message, but we just saw a whole two hours of, 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 of the bullshit, and I like it. We like that. We want to see more of that. So as the time evolved, though, music and movies uh, shape the way the people are gonna be. You know, we up in age, so we know what a couple decades, three, right. four decades look like. Man, listen, uh, four decades ago, y'all, it didn't used to be like this. In the 1900s, Holmes. <laughs> hey, listen, that's how it sounds to somebody right now. Yeah, for sure. 40 years ago, we used to be together, okay? 30 years ago, things began to change. Right. 20 years ago, things changed. 10 years ago, oh my goodness. And today, wow. This is not normal, but if you 10 years old, this is normal. Right. If you 20 years old right now, you grew up on 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 Chief Keef and uh you grew right. up on you grew up on all the the hop the King Vines and all the killers. Yeah, you, you want to be that. You grew up on the futures, the Gucci you a Gucci mm-hmm. man baby. When Gucci man was doing his thing, you was you was just being born. Right. But Gucci man been in so long and others the children learn these songs when they two, when they three years old. Like little kids know songs right now can go bar for bar right. at three. Now imagine they grow up with this song and these other songs, they know more than one. And that's how come we got the type of generation we got right now. Now, how did you not get so in worked with that and, you know, and lose your life like so many, I'm sure, people you know, whether, you know, death, drugs, or going to prison. Mm-hmm. At 14, you said you did your first rap song, like, at, at, at a studio or with a record player? What'd you do? Wait, talk I, to me. I went to Pier 39, which is an amusement park on the pier. It's on the, on the coast in San Francisco at the docks. They had a studio there. Um, it's the type of studios where you can come in and you can sing any of the famous songs at that time. Oh, okay. And they give you the book. It's almost like a karaoke type It's a karaoke and you pay $20 a song. <laughs> and that's where you went. And that's the first time. And Hell this yeah. is, and then I didn't use their book. I just made up raps, saying anything to try to make raps. But I could, this is the beginning stages of me saying, I think I can do this. Okay. 
because I paid twenty dollars a song and that was a hundred and twenty dollars into a fourteen year old in nineteen eighty eight. Oh. <laughs> $120, but for some reason, we would come to this place and play video games all the time as these as a youth. This studio been right here. I never thought to go in there. One day, since I keep we listening to this rap music, man, this NWA and this this, this too short and this this E4. I think I want to do it. I want to try this out. And I would say, come on, y'all. And I use my 120 to pay for the studio time. I learned that from that movie Crush Groove. You got to pay for your own studio time. That's right. Not knowing one day I'm going to be living off this. That mm. movie is real. That part, baby. You have to find your talent. You got to develop your talent. You got to find yourself, you know. Um, when I got that, when I made them songs, back then you remember this radio called the Panasonic. Oh, yes. And they had the double Panasonic with the high-speed dubbing. <laughs> Yeah, they had the single deck, and then they had the high speed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I remember buying blank tapes and a high speed dub off the radio so I can get my songs to people. I want people to hear me. Yeah, that you put tape on top of the other one. <laughs> bootleg over there. <laughs> well, back then, I don't think the boot to bootleg a tape was very <laughs> difficult. Very difficult. But for me to even think. At that young age, at fourteen, I want to make some copies of my music so somebody can hear. Was me. now was there anybody mentoring you with that, or was just pretty much off of you seeing the? It was my dream of watching. I'm a fan of this music, but I don't want to just be. And a this fan. music just started. What people don't really understand, it just started. This is fresh. This, yeah, when you say 1988, that's a transition from 84 to 88. Mm -hmm. Okay, at 84, I was what 11. I was 11 years old, right? So. The music of 1988, I mean, 84, you got to say Run DMC. You got to say the Run baby. DMC. Right. You got to say The Fat Boys. Okay, then you, come in, then you coming into LL Cool J, Houdini. Uh, you got the Boogie Down production. The Boogie there. Down, okay, yep. You come, one. You coming into a different, I mean, it's, 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 it's graduating. It's graduating. It's evolving. It's evolving into solo artists, a lot of more solo That's artists. Right. Okay, the group thing. Is the beginning. You got EPMD in them too. That's right. <clears throat> By the time you get to 88, now you come to EPMD in them era. Okay. Um, Public Enemy still had a presence. Yeah. That's 88. 89, though, NWA, they, they wings start wiggling. The motion began as far as Northern California. They, it starts sweeping. 80, that's 88 to 89, right? But you got the movie Colors. Now you got Ooh. this new genre of gangster streets. This all this album ain't nothing but some niggas talking about shooting, killing, yeah. dope dealing, uh, robbing, you know, taking your bitch, all that type of stuff that is uh, a reality. Like Ice Cube said, man, don't blame us for making fuck the police. We just paint a picture of the shit that's going on. We just doing it with our pen. Y'all writing about stuff, but we... Or, or writing it with our with our pen and paper right. and, and delivering it over music. So we being held accountable, but y'all make the same movies and y'all got books and different right. things. So but the thing is they weren't making money off it. Well, you know, to to be to be exposed to Ice Cube's answer of him saying, Man, I'm a hood news reporter. Okay. So displaying what's really happening, we don't know that we kinda setting the next guys up behind us to like this is standard like we didn't show them nothing better we show them what it what the reality is but that's like when you look at from 88 89 and let's just fast forward to right now and and how the music industry is and it's a billion it's, it's probably almost a trillion dollar business yeah easy easy because some promo with almost anybody right now to have a budget for promo, you can make somebody sell. Yeah, it, it, uh, hip hop is no longer just music. Hip hop is I can sell you some shoes, I can sell you some jerseys, I can sell you some shirts, I can sell you some cars, I can I can pretty much sell you anything. So let's go ahead and move it up to the trillion then, because right now when you yeah. say music industry, you think streaming, think streaming, possibly shows, okay. But merchandising mm -hmm. and shoes and phones yeah. and TVs and, and cars, these dudes promoting cars. It's car budgets <laughs> involved with this, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. Easily. So, 
So uh, I definitely want to say that the new generation have way more access, but I remember we had more access to to those that became before us also. Right. So so now you listen, you're 14, you got your demo, you, you, you went and paid 120 bucks. How many songs did you come up? Six. Oh, you got six songs. I remember Parents Don't Understand. I remember Walk This Way. I remember... Uh, and you, re- oh, you rapped those ones? Is that what you said? This is a song. Oh, okay. Parents Don't Understand. <laughs> Will Smith. Will Smith. <laughs> um, a Run DMC, Walk This Way. A Run DMC is like that. Uh, LL Cool J, I Need Love. See, I remember these but, first songs. Did, this did, is were, what, were you one of the guys that thought LL Cool J was from LA? Cause I used to think of it. When I was a kid, I never thought LL Cool J was from the East what? Coast. <laughs> you know what? I think I knew he was from the East Coast because of what? The movie uh, Crush Group, he was hanging with the New York dudes. But I think Ice-T was in one of those movies, too. Who? Ice-T was in one of those movies. I don't know if it was Breaking or it was one of those movies. Ice-T was in Breaking. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, Ice-T, and Ice-T did that. He got up in there. See, that's the early rap. Yeah. That's what he had to deal with. It wasn't no genre. It wasn't like, you know, an actual slot. It's like he grew into the slot, but it came right. through the movies, Colors. The colors, yeah, Colors. Nah, that's when I really could say I knew Ice-T from that. Yeah, no, I, I had some Ice-T before that because I'm obviously from down here, down south. You would, you would hear Ice-T. You would hear King T. There's some, some other rappers out there that were gangster Oh, rap. yeah, shout out to King T, too. So now you got your, your six songs. What are you doing with these songs? My main thing is that learning from Too Short, I remember he's pre- he said, I pressed my tapes up out the trunk. And I just distributed them to the neighborhood. So that was my goal, to distribute to the neighborhood. At 80, uh, Fast forward of me having these songs, I'm still in the midst of breaking in cars, selling a little bit of weed or something, or a few rocks or something. Anything, you know, that right. a young dude can get his hands on and make some money. And I end up getting locked up. That's uh, November 1989. And... They made me a ward of the state. I ended up doing like 18 months to 12 to like eight months on the ranch, a few months in the uh, group home. And I remember on the locker facility, they was playing Ice Cube and uh, this new artist called DOC. <laughs> and with this video called The Formula. Doom, 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 doom. I was like, man. And it's Dr. High Energy form with the wig. I say, man. <laughs> You know, I'm locked up. Yeah. I heard it right before I got locked up. Easy E got a new artist, his name DLC, some new dude. He busting, he he gassing. Yeah. And dun 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 it's funky enough. Okay. Yeah. That is the kickoff, right? But these songs, when I get locked up on this law on this little uh juvenile lockup facility. They play this music every day. The music video is in the jail. We got a TV in our rec room. And I'm watching these videos like, like, this amazing. Dr. Dre, this the same dude from, from NWA. He got the doctor coat on. He got the dude laying on the thing. He, you know, he got this little potion or whatever. And I'm like, man. <clears throat> so that, I want to say is the, I want to say DLC and Dr. Dre. That right there, that one video, it brainwashed me to say, I got to go home and I got to be like them. I seen NWA and Easy e and them with the big chain, with the Benz, with the Mercedes Benz. I seen the, the, the mansion. I won't end. I, I'm thinking in my young mind that the mansion, the Benz, and the chain is it, coming from music. I heard him say that he was a dope dealer too, but what I'm seeing on TV that look like some rap money. That don't look like no, you know, drug dealer money. That look like you a rap star. Y'all in Benzes. Y'all got all the girls. You got these, you feel me? Like, like That's the lifestyle. That image to a young person, the same how it impact. Because some young dudes are killed for that image right mm. now. Mm-hmm. Without thinking, like, mm-hmm. twice. Like, they're in people's life to, to, to gain mm-hmm. that type of uh, status and, 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 you know, material possessions. But me seeing that, when I got released... 1990, 91, I got released. I got locked up. I was locked up the whole 1990. But this whole 1990, I'm in there starting to write my raps now with a pen and pad instead of me freestyling, just turn the beat on and just say, well, you know, ah, now I got a pen and pad. You're working on your craft. I'm working on my craft because I'm, I'm watching the video 
And when they say it's time to go get on your bunk, and we go get on our bunk, I mean, not our bunk, but go go sit on your bed, because it's a big dorm with hella beds. And at that moment, though, when I get my pen and pad, and I'm remembering these music videos, I'm seeing a Dr. Dre and this new dude called DLC, that made me be like, boy, I got to write, and my partner, he would always use a dictionary. I wasn't mm -hmm. using a dictionary, but I always see that's why your ass got them fucking fancy words. Cause you going in the damn dictionary <laughs> finding new words and I'm just using the what words you know. in my head, right? But I remember learning that from him. Like, if you want to expand your rapping, you gotta have some new words. You Absolutely. can't use the same words, bro. And this is I'm only six, I'm I'm about to be 16, right? So now I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing. When I get out 91, I'm in pursuit. How do you become, how do you get a record deal? How, where's the studio at? Where do you get beats from? Like, oh, you gotta meet a producer. Oh, you gotta meet this guy that got a studio. Like everything, it ain't about no Pier 39 no more. Now it's about, you have to find a real person that has a real studio. As a teenager, I can't say I was looking in the phone book yellow pages or the white page. Like, I can't say that was my pursuit. My pursuit was, who's a rapper? Rapping Fote. Rapping Fote from San Francisco, Theo Mo District. Mm, that's right. Okay, but Rapping Fote, he just featured on Too Short. He don't have a deal. So even though I might have access to him, he can't, give me, he, he can't take me to no deal, right? Okay, so that's out the window. I don't know Too Short, I'm just a fan at this time, right? So taking that thought process of how do I process this now? At this time, you have the click is out in E40, and they talking about, man, we pressing up out the trunk too. Then you got the guy, Mac Dre. You feel me? And Kyrie, Young Black Brother Records. Boom. Damn, on the back of their thing, it say they independent. They got their own record label. So I start catching on like, if I can't get no deal, I'm gonna have to actually probably have to make my own record label. And I'm gonna have to pay for my own studio time. Cause it ain't $120 no more. And I gotta find some beats. Cause I can't use nobody else beats. They gotta be made. Like Yeah, it gotta be yours. So that was the next phase. Let's fast forward to 92. I, I finally get enough money. I get a homeboy to give me a few dollars to help me out with a couple thousand to pay for some studio you time. You got your investor. I found my investor like goddamn, uh, <laughs> yeah. like that movie, uh, uh, Crush Groove. Shout out to Russell Simmons and JB. Boy, hurry up and pay him faster next time. You don't send them two goons beating you up every, <laughs> beating you up all through the whole movie. But I learned from that. Yeah, absolutely. Pay the man, bro. You got to pay the man, bro. That's good business. And that's what I learned. Guess what I did? I paid the man that gave me the money because he probably would, they would have shot me or something. <laughs> this ain't going to be no beat up. You can't borrow money from these dudes that I'm borrowing these little couple. And it's only a couple thousand, 1,500. Yeah, something. but fools will get killed for much less. People get killed for less. <laughs> Come on now. So I actually paid for my studio time. I actually paid to get my cassette tapes manufactured. I remember the price tag for that. It was $649. And that's in the 92, 91? That's in 1992, that's June. $692. I had to pay $300 up front. I paid a balance upon picking up the product. I had to go to a, a, a printing company in my neighborhood on Fillmore Street. Back then, it's a cassette tape, y'all, for those that don't know. It's a plastic thing with some two <laughs> little wheels. With some, it's like, it's, it's hard to explain. It's like some little plastic type stuff that go in a circle. You feel me? And, and and back then, for 500 cassette tapes, with just the case, the clear case, no insert, no picture, no cover. just your words on the tape inside of it, $649 for 500. I remember that because so, I, a little bit over a dollar, like $25, $50 a tape or something like that. Okay. And then from there, I had to press up 500 inserts. How much were the inserts? The inserts was about three hundred dollars. Okay, so you're about fifty cents. So you're about a I got, buck fifty, two bucks for the tape. I remember the paper. these numbers right because I know how much I owe my man's. Okay, because I had to pay for studio time too. You feel me? Um, my man's that made the beats. He didn't charge me no money. His name J Mac. 
from San Francisco, Fillmore District. Shout out to J Mac, the first person to have some beats for me. Shout out to DJ X1, uh, who was Huey MC, also both of them from Fillmore. These are my <clears throat> my first mentors that, that I seen them doing something. I'm like, well, shit, I just ask them. You know, um, releasing these six songs, I had 500 cassette tapes. I had black and white inserts where they typed my info. I took a Polaroid picture as my the, the camera for my first photo right. shoot. I gave it to the print man. I told him I want to... JT, the bigger figure, putting it on the map. Just type that on the front. And then on the inside, here go my songs, here go who produced it, and here go my shout outs. <laughs> you know, back in the days, yeah, shout outs yeah, were yeah. very important yes. to anybody putting out a tape. You look for the shout outs. You look, shout you shout look. outs are still important now. <laughs> now, nah, real talk. And you look for the credits. You look for the, because that means something. That's your business card. If your name, yes. if your name was in Dr. Dre, the Chronic album, I remember this dude named Wolf, something Wolf. And he was the mastermind that played the keyboards on the Chronic album. But I remember seeing that name, something, something Wolf, as. Um, written by, so that means he he fingered. You know, right. written don't mean just pen and pad. Right. Written is whatever keys Came you up might with the come notes. up with. So, and I'm and then there's another guy named in the inside, and I'm and this is and you still remember these till this day. Listen, a guy named Bernie Grunman, mastered by Bernie Grunman. Why do Dr. Drake tapes hit so hard and mine's not? Because he went outside of just mixing on a little 16 track and all that. He on two 24 inch tapes going through SSL with even tides and <laughs> he got uh, Neve compressors and on each track and each channel for every kick and every snare, mm. but that's where money gets you. Yes. And then after he do all that, he give it to these people called uh, Bernie Grumman what they what the name of their company was called? Bernie Grunman Mastering. These names. When my partner went to go master his album in the Bay, I went to a people a place called Rocket Lab. My partner went down there to go see the Dr. Dre dude. Thirty five hundred. I paid eleven hundred. He paid thirty five hundred. But I'm like, I could hear the quality. Uh, which I don't know what secret they got. Right. Like when you give mastering, everybody they don't tell you all the secrets. Sometimes they take the uh, the digital file and dump it to some tape. The tape got some type of knee warm compressor thickener, whatever that stuff is. Then they bounce it back to digital. So when you get your digital copy and you play it in a club or your car and that thing punching without extorting or distorting, that's how you know you got good dope. If you could turn it all the way up to the manufacturers, whatever the, the max is, if you can turn it all the way up and it don't never distort, you got great mastering. If you hear distortion of turning it all the way up, then that's not a good product. So for those of us who do music or we be testing, turn it up, you know, oh, I'm too hot or my vocal's too hot. I, I really like how you how you always kind of make an analogy of it's it's like the dope game and it exactly is. And, and I speak on that sub, some sub too as well, like saying, if we would learn this dope game, it's the same as the dope game. It's the same strategy. It's the same hustle, people. The only difference is they're not going to knock your door down and take you to the feds and take away from your family for 20 or 30 years. Right, bro, JT? Bro, bro, Imagine 1992, the concept of me paying for my own manufacturing, right? That was the only thing separating me from a record deal on Universal is that they can manufacture and put me in the store, plus put me on the radio, put me on mm -hmm. TV, put me on tour. Okay, great, but guess what? They're not going to sign everybody. What do you do? Go independent. And that was the secret that that little cat that was in the bag, I think that's what got out. We wanted to be up under somebody who can pay our bill and make us famous. We never considered, well, how about I just record my album and go press up my tape over here and 
and get some posters and hmm, maybe shoot my video. And next thing you know, when money started to come in, people looked at me like, damn, this is a young genius. But really, I took the dope dealer concept. The dope dealer concept of if you're a black man in San Francisco and you got access to kilos, most likely you got our Latino brothers on your team. You're plugged in. But we don't know that in the fucking hood. We see you with the dope. We see you with the car. We don't know you got a plug. Right. Okay, what is the plug? If you are a drug dealer and you have, let's say, a million cash, I want some, I want some bricks. I need to get some bricks. Some somebody who has supplies, that's not a big number, but it's a great, you're a great sale right now. But yeah, this million sound great. We can supply you. Okay. Let's switch that over. If you're in a rap game or film game and you need to make some shape, first of all, you got to have a recipe. So whoever got a brick recipe, then they can manufacture. So if you cook up a good album or a good movie on your own with your own money, you didn't wait. You did the best you can. You recorded it on an iPhone. You mixed it on the iPhone, whatever. But you got a master copy of your album or your film. Either one, it don't matter. If it's done with this right here, I have shot movies with this. Whole, produ whole production films. No lights, no microphones, strictly everything. Why? Because I'm going low budget to get the product, to get the pack done. Once the pack done, then I could talk my numbers with my pack based upon a completed pack. All that, I'm working on my album, I'm working on the film, I'm working on the script. I'm work Okay, you can't present that to people. In Hollywood, I'm pretty sure there's people who present those type of ideas and they get a big check. But in our world, the reality real world, I got to cook my pack. So I got to start with whatever I have. I can't actually wait uh, for the opportunity to come from somebody else because listen i have feelings and my feelings can get hurt by waiting on another man to help me <laughs> no sir you feel me like you know not in no feminine way but like yeah of course like my hey homie you said you was gonna look out no 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 i got you bro i got you bro a couple weeks go by no calls no nothing you lag it now I'm saying this is a real reality of people that we might have hope in and they see it all right bro I'm, I'm gonna do something bro just give me a minute I got you bro do you know you could damn near he could become an op to you almost in this new day and age? Oh yeah. Oh, you didn't help me. Oh boy, you op, you op now. That quick. It could be years of 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 of, of a relationship, but since you're in a better position with the American Cholo, and it's a guy from high school that you ain't seen, so but he can't act like he part of the American Cholo right. right now, but he can act like it based upon how much he commit and communicate right. with you to, to to make you reconnect like bro we was in the same class bro yeah. you know i don't know yeah. the shit that people say to make you to, to reconnect so the industry when you talk about a plug it's like who can manufacture these cassette tapes these dvds and these compact discs because whoever can do that that's the plug now you got to have your recipe that's a completed pack that's your film. That's your album. Whether it's mastered, whether it's mixed the best, it don't matter. Once you drop it off to them with your pictures and your artwork, they about to wrap that thing in plastic, get you shit, your shit in boxes, but you got to pay that money. Now you have the responsibility just because you got 100 kilos right now, you still got to be willing to dry them bitches around and try dope. to go move them to somebody. <laughs> you can't just have them bitches sitting, oh, I got 100 kilos in my warehouse. Uh, you That's slang cool. This babe, this dope, That's baby. cool. But imagine, uh, 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 just imagine me getting 100 kilos right now, right? Just, just thinking, right? I know guys who do this shit, right? That's out there. There's plenty of guys that do this shit. But man... Is that my lane? I wouldn't really know how much to even start the pricing off at right now. <laughs> You're gonna give us a max eighty nine price. <laughs> I'm about to, you feel me? I heard kilos were ten thousand. <laughs> Shit, not today. You didn't. You didn't got rid of them things the wrong way. Uh -huh. But in the music game, the kilo concept is the completion of a finished product that you have the ability to make a transaction with through licensing, either uh, profit splitting. TuneCore, CD Baby, Empire, Distro Kid, American, uh, United Masters, uh, The Orchard, uh, 
all of these uh, platforms allow you to do profit splitting. Did did well it depends. I've asked this question before to people in your industry, right? And some people say, no, it's not getting burnt. It's learning the process. But have you ever got burnt as far as the business goes? And that was a learning curve for you? I think I want to say I don't. I don't want to use the word burn. See, that's what I'm saying. A lot of guys say no. They don't want to say burn. But if it's looked upon from the eyes of the public, JT, you got burned. <laughs> okay, you can, you, can, you can call it what you want. You can, you can say something else. If, I mean, whatever make you feel better. But you got burned. According to public, the way the general public is viewing this, you got burned. Okay, discovering the rapper, the game, Handpicking him out of, in a room full of 400 people. Where was this? 2002, February 14th, Beverly Hills, Four Seasons Hotel. In the, in the ballroom or the auditorium room, it was 400 rappers. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, I want to see all the rappers. I want to give you a message. To help you as you prepare to deal with the things that's already lined up against you that you don't see. In your industry, there's things that's being maneuvered, that's about to maneuver you guys <laughs> for your own self-destruction. But I want to give you a warning. I want to give you some insight. So I bring some rappers from my neighborhood, San Francisco, down to this event. To come participate, it's the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and it's Russell Simmons. Uh, Suge Knight was one of the, the you know, one of the guys uh, that was, I guess, on the panel or whatnot. And when I come into this room, I bring me and my guys walk in, and I wasn't in the room for no more than ten minutes probably when I noticed this dude rapping, and his name is the Game now, and I just know that. I was supposed to help this dude, but I wanted to be part of what I'm helping also. Of course. But as a man, I can't let the world see me like, oh, I'm heartbroken about something. Like for 20 some years, that was that was over 20, that's 21 years ago. And not to be part of it and to be totally cut up out of it, it was like, that's getting burned. But you can't make somebody be loyal. So me going through many other things with other people who have benefited from me, I've learned that that's what God got for them, and I got to get what God got for me by going to continue now, to now, work. Was there ever, like, uh, an actual, like, conversation that happened between you two guys that ended up, like, him just kind of wanting to erase you off the history with him? What there, Was there, that to be something? This is what happened. When he got the songs, because I released some promo albums, of the project with him and Nas. And back then, was he still going on the, the, the rap name, The Game? Yes, he was going by The Game. Okay. Um, it was, I want to say, so unexpected for him to be in a position to use this new project that's called QB The Compton. You guys can Google this. QB The Compton, The Game, and Nas, presented by JT The Bigger Figure. But me and Daz Dillinger had a project out called Long Beach to Film Out, Daz Dillinger and JT the Bigger Figure. So promoting my new artist since I did so well with me and Game, I mean me and Daz, to start this new artist that I found off, how about I do a mixtape, him and Nas, and blend the songs so that it can give the viewer a chance to enjoy the Nas, which they're already familiar with, but also hear the game which I'm trying to introduce. Give us some exposure. And from that, so many people tuned in based on my marketing and promotion. He was able to take that and go travel around, especially the East Coast, and coming back to the West Coast, doing that mixtape circuit, he was able to showcase his talent, which he worked for. He deserved everything he got. Not I have not one word bad to say. But when he signed to this company called Desperado, Desperado signed him to Aftermath. Desperado didn't have a budget to put the game project out. And game didn't have enough buzz to get the Aftermath stamp 
of activating him as just the game coming out. Of investing in him. Exactly, right? So his interaction with the G-Unit and 50 Cent, that's what activated it, and that's what added the G-Unit label, Desperado, Aftermath, uh, Interscope, and then Universal, whoever they distributing through. So it was a chain of command of money to be split, which is great. The albums that I put out, The Untold Story, part one, two, three, whatever, West Coast Resurrection was another one. These projects gave me a chance to eat off what I actually paid for as opposed to being a part of the big new thing with the Dr. Dre's, the M&M's, the 50 Cent's. Like, I'm not part of that. But it would have been nice to be a part of that. But the good part is that I was no dummy and I wasn't emotional. I took the albums I had and went and got money for it. I never made a bad interview, a diss song, ever. But people say you got burned. So that is probably the biggest thing of imagine you discover him right now and he's the newest hottest sex symbol right now that ladies want but nobody knew it but you just found him right now on your show and then he get a deal with Martha Stewart or somebody and act like he you never was at the right. show he never he, American Cholo right. who is that right. that is the reality of of people since the beginning of time like you can pre, you can pretend to be a friend you could pretend to be a loved one. You could be. A, you could pretend to appreciate someone's effort, someone's work for you, but the whole time could be strictly uh, underhanded. Uh, what, what's that? Uh, what's it, espionage. I don't know. Is it espionage? And yes, <laughs> but it's but it's with a smile uh, that is so believable, bro. Like I know you probably been through oh, that yeah, before. For Somebody sure, no, man, for who sure. you like, not you, bro. Yeah. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> you took a mask? So this is you for real? There's, so you had a mask on this whole time? There's a saying. Wow. Uh, money doesn't change people. It just shows you who they really are. Mm. And, and and that could be the case right there. But I mean, you, I mean, you guys were like, I don't know if friends is the word, but you guys were talking all the time. You guys were like. I had him in my neighborhood paying for his hotel, paying for his food, his studio time, the pictures, everything that needed to be paid for, I was paying for it. I can never say that we was close friends, though. That would be false. Right. But we was cordial enough where he trusted me with his life to come in my neighborhood and <laughs> and, 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 and and go with my plan to, to, to kick him off. It would have been nice for an acknowledgement. It would have been nice for a shout out in the album. You know, the credits back then, it was still credits. I ain't see my name. I'm like, okay. Yeah, I saw a clip. <laughs> I saw a clip on uh what's that? Drinks uh Drink Champs. Drink Champs, and they asked him about it and he completely like dismissed the whole thing. And I was like, you know, if 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 me personally, if that if you had that coming, I'd be like, yeah, but that guy did put me on, yada yada, you know. He can't acknowledge it. It fuck with his ego to this day. Now, did he just completely, like, once he got the deal, just cut you he off? Got the like, deal. Didn't call you, he got nothing? the deal. Let Ghost me tell you. you, he got the deal. They gave him 50000 up front. Do you know he spent that money in 60 days, and he was back in the Bay Area? Oh, I could see that. Coming to do verses. But the word had got out that he signed the Aftermath, but we saw no motion. But we heard about it. We saw it, on the inter we saw it online. Uh, Dr. Dre signs new rapper The Game. That was major, but but for him to come back to the bay, I was able to get him. I was can't, I bought some verses from him, and I had got a receipt, aka just signed the contract, <laughs> and that's how I got my money. <laughs> Shout out to the game. He came back one more time, nigga, and I caught him before Fifty Cent got him, nigga. Before he signed with Curtis Jackson, he signed with Joseph Time. And that was the way that I was able to get my funds because he ran off. That's business. That's just business. You signed this, right? They like, shit, he, yeah, I did sign it. Yeah, but I didn't lie on here. These my songs, nigga, I just paid you for. This my shit. He was hard for money. You wanted the money because you spent all your money. Now, have you seen, aside from like the game, because 50 racks ain't that much money, maybe to a young person, but have you seen where somebody who's made, let's say, over a million dollars and then you catch him in a couple of years and this fool's pretty much dead broke back at mom's house or something yes man 
Yes, and I don't really want to say names, but I want to say elements of mistakes. Of course. If you never had a million dollars before, right? If we just ask every, anybody in the general room, if we got you a million dollars right now, what would you do first, right? Most people will say, I will buy a house. Okay, how much is a house right now? <laughs> a million dollars. How much? A million dollars. <laughs> okay, so we're not buying a house probably. Okay, what's another? I, because you can't buy the house or you got to buy a cheaper house or in a different state or something. So let's just say, let's say 250000 right? You never had a million dollars. Right. You got it in your account. You need to secure some things right now. What's that? Buy a house. So let's just say two fifty. What's the next thing a person that never had a million dollars do if you got seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars left? They're gonna buy the whip. They're gonna okay. Buy the hold on, stop. <laughs> okay, let's okay, stop because okay. we're gonna do, do some math. Oh, let's do it. Let's do some math. You know they're gonna buy the whip because all of us always had a vision or a dream of one day having a million dollars. But the day you get it, if you're not careful, you'll be back to just you'll be back with us. <laughs> Because people who get a million dollars, that is that is so much of a responsibility to when your pockets start calling you, you in your dream thinking what you buying tomorrow. You don't know what's gonna happen. Why? Happen. The money's in my account. I've been thinking about anything. I've been always come on, let's let's be real. Yeah. A million dollars in your account can put you in a position that if you don't have a strong family support structure, <laughs> you, if you got a rapper, if you even got 10% type rapper type in you, you got to let the world know, baby. This million don't mean shit. This million don't mean shit in no bank account. I can't flush no bank account unless I take a screenshot oh, and go to Instagram. I can get some, I can shine right now if I screenshot my bank account and put it on Instagram, right? They do it. Guess what people do, though? Hey, these motherfuckers got to see me. What, what they got to see? I got to buy the car. Now, let's talk about cars right now. Is $100,000 enough to get something for somebody who's supposed to be got a million dollars? Is 100000 or is it 200000 They want that family, Let's be baby. real. Let's be real. Let's be, if you want to show, if listen, you got a million. Streets, streets heard you got a million. How do you let them know you got a million? You got this house. And 250 ain't really about nothing. No, 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 no. But that could be conservative. You a smart type guy. You got a conservative one somewhere. 200000 I believe, you might spend on a car. Yeah, easy. Fine. Out of a million, that's 20%. Let's be real now. I got to let y'all know that I'm... I'm balling. Because with a million dollars cash, you don't have a million dollars credit. Mm -hmm. With a million dollars cash, you don't even have $200,000 credit. To go in the store, to go in the Phantom or go in the Lambo or the Corvette or the, you can't go in there. They are gonna tell you we need the payment. How do you know, JT? Cause I got a mean, and they told me I thought I had good credit with the mean, <laughs> and I don't have no credit with a mean. Oh shit! This is the truth, bro. Like a mean could be a gift and a curse. Now we all want it, whether it's a gift or a curse or not. <laughs> but the way your stomach feel after you had a meal and it ain't here no more. That's a different type of level of regret. I'm going to tell you about it. Thank God I don't have that. Because I did what I felt I was supposed to do. Good business moves. You feel me? There's a few mistakes along the way. Well, maybe a lot. But <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of mistakes along the way. But guess what I can say? I never want to blow my budget to look good. I'd rather try to make an investment and lose it. And buy a car, nigga, and be broke with a goddamn right. phantom and got it selling anyway. But you've seen that. That's the thing that I've seen with the guys right now that have had the five million. Imagine some of my guys that mm. ran through a five mil, bro. They, they believe that money's gonna keep coming that bro, quick. Bro, listen, and it doesn't. Listen, the way you got the five play a big part because it might just be the last five you gonna ever have, right? Because you're not lined up in a business where five is available. Not even one million is available if you didn't, if you didn't invest That's into it. that business right. or get familiar with a business. But to get a five piece, mm. most people is not saving unless you got a, a strong family group around you like, baby, we can't blow this money. That's it. This shit got to last us to a couple years, like damn near almost. And we're gonna have to be working. Maybe we gotta get some jobs. Why? 
Imagine getting having five men for you and your family and your close people who, and you you letting them know like, look, y'all, we got some money right now, and I'm trying to establish something where I need y'all to participate so that this money stay here. And that you all come on board to help facilitate and what businesses should we do that will bring in a stream of income to protect this money? Yes, sir. Because if not, money will be in your bank account. And then to find a way to leave your bank account oh, for, for, sure. for various reasons. And I don't know if it's a spirit of money that talk to you in the morning. Or maybe at night. I don't know. Is it, do the money call you in the morning, or is it? I think it's the morning because you want to go shopping or you want to go buy something. I, I believe it's the uneducated part of us. When I say us, I mean mostly minorities. We we get that money and it burn. Even to today, people that work, <laughs> you know, paycheck to paycheck, they get the money and they get paid Friday by by come Monday. They're broke because they went out there above their means. Don't invest it. Don't save for a rainy day. Do you think? high rent play a part in that i believe it abs now absolutely absolutely so do you so so absolutely so rent prices based upon those who work because i don't know the uh the pay rate right now right oh. if, if i was getting a thousand a week i think i could be kind of happy depending on how many hours and depending on where you live okay now see because now. that's expensive but this is the thing like my i'll, I'll make my my son an example my wife cooks all the time. We have food. So food is at home. Food is at home, bro. You don't got to go shopping. You don't got that food comes in every day with some food from outside, somewhere else. Yeah, that's he, money. He, he, that's money. He goes out and eats. I'm sure when he's out working, and I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm like kid, we got food here, man. You don't got to blow your, you know. Even for me yeah. at work, I take food to work. I do construction. I know off the lunch truck, I'm gonna spend twenty bucks, and it's like, you know what? Nah, man. I got my lunch. I, I do and my you thing. bring it, and you bring it. But and, and I tell young guys when they start working as well, I said, hey, man. Save your money. And I tell them also this. Every paycheck you get, buy a tool. Whether it's a tape measure, whether it's a hammer. Or something that invest, will help you. Invest in yourself. In yourself. And, and I think that's what's lacking in our community. Like a, like a lawnmower. Whatever kind of work you're doing. Whatever. Like I do I do concrete construction. So mine That's what that's the that's the foundation. I do the the big foundations up in the hillsides where you see these houses up in the air to kinda, make them stay and then ain't no earthquake. Yeah, Earthqu it, earthquake proof. The ones like in Beverly Hills and Bel Air. That's where I'm. Come at. on, baby, <laughs> come on, name drop a few for me, baby. Listen, come, come listen, on. we got to promote this business too, bro. Like, listen, do you need your concrete done? No, no, we're 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 good. <laughs> All you'll do is get a bunch of haters up in there. Oh, they gonna hate <laughs> trying try to go on Yelp talking about bad oh, reviews. Okay, no, that's okay, that's okay. We just playing, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's keep going with you, JT. So you, you did your thing. When do you really when when do you consider that you were you were on? You were finally on the scene where you're okay. I'm on now. 1994. And before you say that, what what did, have you always had this great memory? God, I love it, dude. I love it. Do you, you got know? The dates. Do, do you know that has been something that I think is because it impacted my life so much. Yeah, I feel the same way. The dates I remember. Because when those dates come around, I reminisce on things that happen on particular dates, right? So if we want to, let's let's look at let's, let's let's check out my timeline real let's quick. Do it. Let's check out my timeline. June 1992, I dropped six songs with a Polaroid cover, black and white. Total investment about twelve hundred dollars. Did I pay my producer for the first six songs? I don't even remember. I don't remember. I paid the studio time. I remember borrowing fifteen hundred, and my man said, "Bro, you didn't buy no ounces with that dish." <laughs> my man is like, "You didn't go buy no." I said, "Bro, I'm a rapper, bro." That's right. Okay, boom. This June '92, five hundred cassette tapes. I remember giving out probably two hundred cassette tapes. I remember selling about approximately three hundred cassette tapes. I sold the cassette tapes to record stores and people. Cassette tapes at that time cost eight to ten dollars. I wholesale three dollars, five dollars, depending on. I remember making back the money to give my man's. That's June '92. I get some more money from another guy. He had a few more dollars. He believed in me a little more. He like, I'm gonna buy you a computer. You make your own beats. I told him I want to be like Dr. Dre. I get a Macintosh computer. It wasn't called Apple back then. The 
was called Macintosh. Right. It had a, it had the symbol with the with the five colors with the little apple sign like somebody bit it. It was a desktop, it cost thirteen hundred dollars. I never forget it. Ooh, Getting, that's a lot of money back then. Boy, listen, I get this computer. I start working on an album called. No, hold on. Let's let's, let's go back a, just a couple of notches. Let's go back a couple of notches before I get the computer. I'm working on my album now. It's called Don't Stop Till We Major. It released November 16th, 1992. Guess who else dropped November 16th, 1992 on that day? The Chronic? The Chronic album. <laughs> I remember that. The Chronic album. Do you know, listening to Doc, that's, that's, the, that's when I learned that this thing called mixing and mastering is serious. It can mean the difference of being a hot-ass album and not a hot-ass album. Even though your music is what it is, I, I still was able to capture my people. For the whole next 1993, I worked on the album. I got that computer when I dropped the album. The album is called Players in the Game, November 18th, 1993. Guess who dropped on November 18th, 1993, one year later? Drop that one. Snoop Dogg. Oh, that's right. Snoop Dogg, right. Doggy Style, <laughs> oh, on the exact same day, on the exact same day. You got some major competition there. <laughs> Listen, do you know when, because they didn't announce the album, they, they didn't say, oh, the album coming out on this day. It just came out on that day. They didn't, we heard a Snoop Dogg album is in the making. We heard about that. Man. Listen. When I heard that album, it made me feel like I heard the Chronic album all over again, except this time it's with this nigga named Snoop with all these other dudes. And you know, it was a continuation, right? Right. I felt proud of the album I made in 1993, Players in the Game. I worked on it. I worked, I, I bought these new machines. They was called ADAT tapes, and it was eight tracks of digital audio using a VHS tape. For those that oh, don't know shit. what that is, a VHS tape is similar to a regular cassette tape. A VHS tape is a visual product that has tape in it that you put on this little thing and it spins around. The, the visuals right now, I want to say, in 1993, the Snoop Dogg album, where he turned from a human being into a dog. Mm, I when, I, when we saw that, man, we ain't never saw no shit like that. <laughs> where he turned from a human being into a dog. Him and Daz and them running down the hill. Yeah, and the beat kicks in. Like, 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 bro. So that, guess what that did? That made me have to dig in even deeper. Let me tell you what I started to do. I was proud of my album, Players in the Game, 1993. But Dr. Dre album and this Snoop Dogg, damn, this, this damn Snoop Dogg, bro, this damn Snoop Dogg and this damn Dr. Dre. These two albums, the production and the sonic quality and then the visuals of him from a human being to a dog running, like you know, it's a you know, it's fun. It's kind of funny. It ain't too gangster. I'm like, bro, I got I got to work on my shit. I start working on a new album. It's called Get Low Players GLP, straight out the lab, right? I drop it March 18th. Guess what drop on March 18th? What's and y'all got to pull these numbers up to what's, see if I'm lying. What's dropping? A Bud and Rim soundtrack by Dev Row with Tupac. <laughs> Nigga, god damn it. Do you hear me right now? I ain't got to put no fucking cap on this shit, man. I'm really emulating these dudes, but I don't know these dates. But Def Row, foundational dates, I match their dates with an independent product. Yeah. I didn't have no deal. I didn't have no budget. I didn't have no manager. I didn't you had no clue. They're just trying. Listen, the Above the Rim soundtrack was so amazing. In my album, I got every rapper I could find from my neighborhood 
and I made the beats with my new studio, and now I'm more of just the producer. I'm gonna rap on a couple songs, but really, I wanna be like Dr. Dre. I wanna be like Snoop Dogg, and I wanna be like Suge Knight all in one. That was my vision. I want to be. I want the artistry of a Snoop Dogg. I want the production of a Dr. Dre. And I want the business acumen of a Suge Knight. I want to be independent doing this because I ain't got no manager. I ain't got no label helping me. I ain't got nobody help backing me up. I'm just a young dude that messed around and found out something called the independent game. So are you doing this full time at this point? I'm full time. I never had a job. I don't sell dope. I don't pimp bitches. I don't do credit card scams. All I know is the rap game. Music. My name JT the bigger figure. If you Google my name, you will see fifty thousand pages on Google. Just who the fuck is this dude? Where, where did I know the JT part? It's your first and last name, but where yeah. did the bigger figure come from? And how how long did it take you to come out with that name? Do you know? In nineteen ninety one, when I was released from the the the, the juvenile lockup, right? I'm seventeen. As I stated earlier. I'm in pursuit of knowledge of how do I be how do I get a record deal? How do I how, how do I make an album? Where do I get a, the music from? I didn't even know the word producer. I never knew that word until at, around that time. Oh, you need a producer. What is what the hell is that? Oh, they make the beat or they, you know, you need a musician and the producer put the keyboard player with the drum player and all, you know. I'm in pursuit. I start thinking about if I'm gonna be a rapper, you gotta have a name, and it just can't be JT. It can't, it just can't do that because that's not gonna be good. So I start putting different names behind JT, right? Or a name before such and such JT. And that wasn't working. I told my partner, he said, everything you said sound whack. Everything is garbage. Let me just tell you this straight up. If I was you, I call myself JT the bigger figure. Because back in the days, that's the word that everybody who felt like they were somebody, they would call themselves a bigger figure. That's right. So if I was you, I'd call myself JT the bigger, the bigger figure. figure. I say, oh, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Oh, shit. Shout out to Timothy Washington, man. OC Projects, Eddie Street Filmo. That's what's up, man. That it's man said, if I was you, I call myself JT the bigger figure because that's like you a bigger figure, but you saying your name is a bigger figure. And now you just be, become that. That's I'm like, damn, that's, that's that. But guess what I hate about that name? What's that? When you got to sign an autograph, JT oh. the <laughs> bigger <laughs> figure. What's up? Much love. Hey. Next person, JT. <laughs> Boy, do you know when I seen my other partners, San Quinn, uh, he San done. Quinn, uh. He finished. Demo, uh, he's done. Seth, he done. J T the <laughs> bigger. <laughs> Hell nah, bro. I, I better, got tricked into that. You better make an acronym for that, man. Hey, <laughs> listen. Hey, listen. I, if I'd have knew that, I would have never picked the long name. I just didn't know. You know, cause I, you know, even when they put my name on stuff, people names be right there, and then my J T the bigger figure. Hey, it's a, it's, like, it's a smooth name, baby. It's a smooth name, J T. What you want, player? Nah, but you know what? I, now I accept it better, because guess what? I'm the only bigger figure in the whole rap game as of right now. If you type in any other bigger figure, nobody come up with me. Hey, uh, quick question before I forget. Uh, uh, first, shout out to Gold Toys for putting Man, this thing together. Can I say something about of that? Of course, huh, boy? Listen, Gold Toes, bro, is one of the realest Latinos in the North, man. In that North San Francisco, man, that man really pushed a hard line. It was people that came to try to press gold toes, and that boy is solid as a rock. Like, the man stand up so tall, especially on be, on this black and brown unity. Yeah, for sure. You know, his vision helped our communities really come together. Like, yeah. we already interacted as people, but when he came with the term black and brown, like, this art, this us, we had to get behind him. You know what I mean? When was the first time you ever met that guy? I met gold toes in 1996. 
Um, I had just been released, or we just put out San Quinn album called uh, The Hustle Continues, and it was a dude named Chuck Kelly who had new gold go toes, and they started to interact and bring a couple ideas. He wanted to make a project that represented the black community, the brown community, call it black and brown, uh, highlighting the Latino artists to get them some shine. The black artists, we was already shining, but it's like, let's bring our Latin brothers in. Nice. And he was the architect of that. And I came behind that to stamp it. Shout out to Mac Dre and them too. Nice. Messi, Mar, San Quinn, everybody else, they Legends, stamped it. Baby. You know, and, but Go Toes, man, is like, it's people that came to Go Toes that really tried to stop him from doing that. And when I saw that, I was like, man, but he always just stood tall. Like, he not no pushover. He ain't no dude you could just come up there and mess with. Like, he's somebody that if he snap his fingers, it could be a lot of problems. But he always maintained positivity, even though he could cause chaos. Right. Imagine a man that can cause chaos, but he always showed a love. I say, I think that's why me and him became more like brothers, because I'm like, this is a powerful dude, but he really hold back his power to try to help things Resolve like yeah. he he not like a messy dude. He don't add himself to controversy. Yeah, he's trying to make peace and just you know all, all around make a better life. I think for for both brown and black, just like the nah, much. real talk. And then you know, um, by me being from the north, right? When I used to come down here and work with the guys, the Southsiders, the the Serrano family, right? I never felt a difference. Like, I never looked at it like, oh, these is different. My Latinos from the north, from the south. Only difference is the name and the color right. of the rag. But in terms of the interaction, it always been positivity with me and my black community, with the with the brown community. Like, I always been an advocate for the brown community. I always spoke up. When, before the popularity, I was the one on the front line before the Latin artist was popular. Right. See, it was La Raza. Uh, what is it? The music. What's the music before the, the before the Latin rap? What's the other music before the Latin rap that was big? Well, it was it was just like you got Chicano rap, and then and before that, it's just like freestyle music, and you know you have just straight Latin music, cumbias, and everything else. But as far as like within in the inner city, it was well, it eventually became Chicano rap. It was just Chicano regular rap, but it was just regular rap at one point. Okay, was Chicano rap? English and Spanish? Yes. So it was it's still it was, around. Yes, yes. You had some. But did it start as Spanish and then go to English, or was it, did I, it start with English? No, I think it started with English. The one who, I guess, you can say put it on, even though there's there'll be some people who say there, there was before and there was, was like a Kid Frost. That was. Kid Frost. When you heard Kid Frost okay. for Raza, that was. That it was, was just rap, but eventually the, the music industry so Kid labeled Frost it. Kid Frost would be considered what? Rap? Or I would say Kid Frost was actually just rap, but eventually what happened in the music industry, they started labeling the Latino guys. Oh, those guys are Chicano rappers. Chicano rappers. Yeah, which at the time really lowered the bar and said that's like a yeah. secondhand kind of. It, it okay. really was. Because at the, at the beginning okay. of it, you had some real good rappers in there that were, you know, just rappers. But it, I think once the music industry did that, it kind of put them on the shelf. Would, and, you, and, put, would you put Cypress Hill... And Kid Frost in the same sentence. Uh, yes. Believe same it or not, sentence. Yes, yes. Kid Frost and Cypress Hill will be in the same sentence. From, from the beginning, yes, because the person who is responsible for putting Latino rappers on, whether some people like it or not, is Kid Frost. Because, First. Because Kid Frost. I remember Kid, Kid Frost, Frost. Yeah, Kid Frost was like the same. Yes. Run DMC. Remember when Run DMC had yes. that song with uh, yes. Walk This Way? Yes. And they, they did it on MTV, and yes. that, everybody saw Run DMC. That was Kid Frost. Frost yes. At Frost, when he came in, my brother comes what in. What was room. it? What was his first big song? It was doom, 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 doom. And then it goes, this for Rasa. And then it kicks in. But yes. it, it's, a, it's a banger, brother. It's a banger. It's a banger. And he's, yes. definitely, he's yes. definitely the guy yes. who put that on into the mainstream national level. So Gold Toes would be our Kid Frost. I, I would say, yeah, Gold Toes. Up, up, up north. Up there. But Gold Toes also was Kid Frost mixed with a bit of. Dr. Dre and mix a little bit of Suge. Mix yeah, he mixed with. <laughs> yeah, now matter of fact, you know what? That's right. That's the truth. He mixed with so many. Like his his, you can call him like a bridge. Yes. Like he bridged the communities. Like he made himself available. Like Gold Toes had got in a situation, but 
our brothers and sisters from the nation of Islam saw that this is a good man. Yeah. They trying to railroad go to put him in prison. We had to bring our brothers and sisters from oh. the nation of Islam that came and, and salute to the minister of, of Mosque 26, who was like, nah, this is a good man. That's right. You know, whatever his past is, they try to make his past be his present. They so, always do that. So, um, nah, but we want to shout out Goto's man. For Thank sure. you, brother, uh, for, for making sure that this happened because he's a... He just phenomenal. That's all I want to say. He's phenomenal. Now, just to give you, uh, I guess, uh, some uh, information as far as, like, with us down here from the South, right? There's always a, a misconception that, you know, they'll try to, oh, these guys are racist. These guys are this. When it comes to us and, and let's say, brown and black conflict, it's always been a gang thing. And anybody it's who's... It's a specific gang it's thing. It's a gang thing, homie. Whether yes. it comes from the joint, whether it comes from the streets, yeah. it's a gang thing. And anybody who's a real gang banger and is a brother, and I've had plenty of them here, they know what it is. They know the reality. It, they know the reality of that street yes. life, homie. It's usually people who are from out of town, not even from the state, that they will sit there and say, oh, those guys... Nah, homie. Um... My, come Black on, and brown is right it. here. People don't see it. Yeah, we we've always had homies in the hood that were brothers. We've always been good. It all it is is it's a it's a, it's a gang thing. Like when you break it down, who do brown kill more? Brown. When you break it down, who do black, black kill more? Black. black. Nah, that's right. And and you know what? That's why I didn't know the politics of how the South run. Um, growing up in the Fillmore district. The last high school I went to before I got locked up was Mission High School in the Mission District with all the homies, right? So that's where I got my first introduction to the Latino life. Right. And and and, and being classmates and and, and learning the, some of the words right. and uh uh the way the cars pull up and you know just the the, the, the lifestyle, lingo, the right. lingo. So I always lean toward the Latin community because I got exposed to it and we were friends. It wasn't, I didn't know nothing about uh, prejudice and all that or or I'm better or the Latinos never act uh, better than me. Like we all kind of felt like we was all in a struggle together. It felt more like a struggle together and, and as, we really opposed, are. as opposed to uh, the differences that what whatever our differences are that make us different. But when you living in the hood together, man, ain't no difference. You going to the same gas station, the same corner store. Uh, we go to the same school. You go to the same doctors we go to. So there is no difference. And in San Francisco, we got the benefit of the black and brown easy unity. Now, I, I heard down south and on this side, it was times where it would just be tension yeah. That the gang stuff like that you're saying is spill over to the regular black and brown people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Where now they're being affected Absolutely. by something that they have nothing to do with. Absolutely. But I, on this show, I'm happy to be here to, to to let the world know, like, man, black and brown is. Oh, that's not love over here. Homie. Listen, man, it's it, it it can never be the separation that's being promoted because I believe them as outside forces that's putting them Absolutely. different videos up like the blacks against the, the Mexicans right. and all. No, man. We ain't... No, man. Now, in prison, I understand there's different politics. That's jail, homie. But on the streets, right. we right here Yeah, for sure, JT. Family for love. sure, JT. Yeah. You, you got the hospitality coming over here, Come brother. Come on, man. Do you know, I do want to say this, though, too. There was... Some bad videos put out that JT hate Mexicans. Oh, I saw those JT. I was gonna rush you when I saw you, phone. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what? Them videos is edited, and I got too much history with my Mexican family to even do that. I had some Mexicans come attack me about. I saw those. Hey man, you and JD, y'all need to kill each other. I said, hold on, bro. Black people can't get into Latino people community uh, and, and, and yeah, politics, right. bro. There we have no voice. I don't think you should be over here talking about me and another man killing each other. If we gonna kill each other, let us do it. But don't you be an instigator. And from there, it just snowball. But I'm glad me and Gotos could clear yeah, it up. Yeah, I saw that. And man. people like, man, some dudes love each other, man. And <laughs> this shit fake. Nah, it wasn't fake. It was that my words got cut up with a headline, JT the bigger figure going at the La Raza. I'm like, what the I mean, fuck? You were pretty pissed though, JT. You were pretty pissed. The man is you coming at me, <laughs> but guess what I learned? 
I do got to apologize to my La Raza community because I said some words, but I'm talking to this Mexican right here. Yeah. That's like if I'm talking to a nigga and I'm like, nigga, this motherfucker really, it was a setup. I think it was a setup. Them people set me I, up. I, I, I've got the same, probably a worse edit video than you did that went super viral after that. And they said you. Yeah, I'm saying the ER word, which I, I said it, but not in that context. I was saying it in a context where one of my boys got out of prison mm -hmm. and we knew a brother that we've known for years. And I said, hey, let, let's say it's like me and him, right? And I tell him, hey, let's go to JT's house. And this fool says, and I said, and my homie says, F that ER. And I was like, whoa, what? F that ER. And I was like, nah, homie, you're tripping. That's the homie. And I said, and that's how people come out of prison. But now I can say that my homie's not on that train anymore. So they, they, they got those clips, edited them, and just had me say F that ER. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that, shit. That's the internet, that's baby. How the, that's how they got me. That's the internet, bro. I say, hold on, bro. Hey, y'all, they like, nah, man, they the La sound. they mad at you, JT. I say, hold on, bro, y'all tripping, bro. Let me call Gold Toast. You know what it is? Let at, me call. At, at we the, finna clear this shit up. I need to clear my face because I need my La Raza with me. We at, all together. At fuck the, you at mean? At the end of the day, it's communication. Communication. And that's, that, we lack that in both of our, both of our communities, brown yes. and black. Because, yes. unfortunately, we, when we have a misunderstanding, especially in the streets, the first thing you want to do is, well, let's catch that fade. Or let me get my gun. Oh, oh let me, yeah, after that, let me, well, that's the thing now that's more dangerous because of social media. You catch yeah. that fade, somebody videotapes it, you and, and they now try. you got to do it. Now they, or they, or they pressuring you. You let them slap you or you yeah. let them do yeah. this or you let them come. Yeah, yeah. And then what am I going to do? Crash out? I'm going to smoke right. this guy? Boy. And, and then, oh, well, oh where, no, where, where's American man. Cholo? He's no, in the joint. No, but he's in the joint no, doing life. Like, come no, on, no, oh, man. No, man. No. Right? Situations. I think when you're younger, it's harder to grab it. Yes. When you become a little older, you can kind of see, if I do this, bro, this I, I know the outcome. Yes. I, like, I know the outcome. But when that situation, it was like, if I see him right now, oh, we, yeah. got to, we got to yeah, deal with yeah, this yeah. right now. Yeah, for sure. On this level, and it ain't too much really talking, because you playing. You don't yeah. know. You can't play with the... Man. But, but you know what? What really, what really helped me in that situation... That, that Sunday, I go to uh, a car wash down the street for one of my homies' funerals to raise some money, right? Mm -hmm. And I got a bunch of young kids coming up to me like, hey, fool, what's up? Hey, fool, what's up? And I'm like, nah, but I'm not going to let you crash out for this. Homie. Nah, hell. But you know, but in the hood, that's the... That's the concept. That's we got to make an answer for this. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. nah, man, I got, I got all these young guys over here. Am I going to really... Nah, nah. I mean, no, and the, man, and that, and no. And that's what makes an actual real big homie, real leader to sit there and say, you know what, brother? I'm not going to let you Fall crash back. Out. Yeah. Homie. Because that blood on, on your hands is something to deal with. Yeah. He, Imagine one of your little homies, like, he love you so much. Yeah. You didn't know this little dude really love you, bro. And he going to do it. Yeah. It kind of going to put the pressure on you to have to help take care of him now. It's like he become another child in this situation. But I'm going to have him become a man and lose his entire life over something that but, really wasn't that serious. But you know what? If you clear your name by telling them fall back and they do it, y'all wanted to do this. Don't use me yeah, as yeah. the reason. Like, this was something y'all already had in your mind. If I told you fall back, because if I'm willing to let it go, for my sanity, for my peace... I'm not losing no sleep over this. I'm very upset, right. but that can that can that can that can fade. Yeah, let it come here in that different yeah, story. Yo, yeah, yo, 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 yo. <laughs> ego can go. <laughs> uh, ego can be right here, and he can come all the way back I, down I've seen, and I've, smooth his ass out and put him right back over yeah, there. Yeah, I've seen many people lose their lives for their ego, man, for that pride. Nah, that ego, and that's like somebody who got a gun, and a person with so much ego, like nigga, whoop, 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 and they. Bro, I told you, just leave me alone. Yeah, that happens all the time. And then somebody really did it. Bow. Yeah. It's almost like, damn, did you want to just die? Yeah. But it. your ego ain't letting you fall back. Right. I mean, I could just tell you, man, that Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg shit, that, 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 that layout of dropping projects of their three foundational projects, Above the Rim was left field of Death Row. Why? Because it's a soundtrack that got to do with a real movie up under new cinema, and but it's up under Death Row mixed with new... Like, that's a different combo pack because we know Death Row huh? from Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. But now they got their hands in this? What in the world is going on? Change when, the game. And then, hold on. A few months later, murder was the case. Mm. 
Now they got a VHS movie that they said they paid $800,000 to make that movie. Me and Master P sat on my bed and watched that movie at my mama house in my bedroom. Oh, shit. And we both said, this is phenomenal. Murder was the case. The devil turns into, you know what I'm saying? There goes some more of that turning into <laughs> something. And it's like, that is amazing because that's like, that's not normal. Even making movies back then wasn't like, it wasn't common. If you had a movie, that meant that, that, that's, that says that you have a budget. That says that you are tied in with professionals. Next level stuff. At that point, 92, 93, 94. For sure. If you even had, like, it wasn't no movie, just some guy with a movie. Like how it is today, just right. a guy with a movie. But me and Master P signed with Priority Records. Now, when you when you met Master P, he was not Master P, he's just a regular guy. No, he guy. was Master P trying to make his way. Trying to make his, his name at that point. I didn't know he was from New Orleans until later. When I heard his voice, I'm like, he sounds strange. He sounds strange. <laughs> yeah, but he from, you know, to us, okay, he from Richmond. No, he from New Orleans. It's not from Richmond. Okay. So, but this is things we learned as once he of got course. big. All right. Now, I get familiar with Master P music. 93. It was garbage to me. Oh, shit. Nah, but because everybody know. That's why you don't know nothing about these albums. Pure garbage. Why? He's trying to find his way. Okay. He's in a new environment. Coming from New Orleans, you know, they do the booty shaking shit. They got gangster rap. But New Orleans was big with that. You know what I mean? Like that party shit. They got the gangster shit too. Master P, his first songs that I heard, it had a little bit of that. It didn't have like the Bay Area sound that we're known for now. It didn't have a California sound. It was it sounded like a producer who was making something for down there with some sounds of out here, all right? 94, I do my first production for Master P at my mama house. This is our first introduction. But before that, our real first introduction was 1992 at the time of when I put out uh, Don't Stop Till We Major, the same time the Chronic album came out. I had a show in Richmond. Long story short, we got jumped in Richmond. Oh, <laughs> Master P and his guys, you know, uh, it was a situation. We didn't start it, but we was the victims. Yeah, we had to take a beating that night. So shout out to Master P and his guys. We man. all take L's, baby. Yeah, they had a good day that day. <laughs> yeah. But the next time I saw Master P, he was calling me to spend some money with me. So I didn't care nothing about the beat down. Yeah, I didn't care. That was 94, riding right around. I wanna say, I wanna say around July, August, Master P come to my house working on this new project called The Ghetto Trying to Kill Me. And I produced the first track, Player Haters. Player Haters. Me, him, and San Quinn do that song. I think I produced one more track on there for him. And that's our introduction. A few months later, our next introduction, he paying me to do a song for West Coast Bad Boys, his first compilation featuring all the Bay Area artists. That's our second introduction. You know. so, so he came out here looking in the bear, looking for talent, or how did he come out here? No, he came out here. He was a dope boy. He was a dope boy, <laughs> trap boy. Oh, you know, that's according to what he said, right? Of yeah, course. Yeah, I didn't say that, so let's clear that up. <laughs> Master P said I was a dope boy. Okay, I opened up a record store. His record store was part of his dope boy business. You got a record store, niggas buy tapes, they buy some ounces, buy a brick. But buy, he was know. a hustler even from way back when. He was with, he, he he lived it. He talked about it. He rapped about it. He did it. Um now you took off to you took off to the ATL at one point, no? Yeah, I took off to the ATL 2010. Um after a long time in the Bay, you know, working in California for what I could do. Right. Um Zay Tobin is my little brother. Not my blood brother, but just yeah. family orientated. 1999 or 1998, me and Zay Tobin hook up. 1999, we are continuing to make more music, but his family have got a house now in Atlanta, in Atlanta, Georgia. His mother and them set up shop. They leave and move. 
January to uh, February 2000, the year 2000. So now he's living in Atlanta. I'm still in, in California. For 10 years straight, he kept telling me, you need to come down here. So 2010, I finally took his that long. <laughs> <laughs> After seeing Gucci Man and Waka Flocka and, and, hey, and all these man. dudes. Yeah, like with just, he like, bro, it's a bigger market. Like they more happier down south. They want to party. They, they got trying to kill each other. <laughs> and Cali, y'all shooting each other. It's drive-bys. It's, 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 the shit is out of, you know. Yes. So when I go there, it became probably one of the best moves and decisions I made because it gave me fresh wind to be in a rap game still. From 2010 to 2013, I moved to Africa in 2019. So I did nine years in Atlanta, making movies, making albums, doing albums with Future, with Gucci Man, all them dudes. I got product with them. Kevin Those Gates. Those are all huge talents. I mean, now, back then, were they just kind of... Just up and coming. Just up I just and coming. got lucky. I, I got an ear. I got an ear and an eye for talent. Young Thug, Migos. Before Dude, you guys that's knew, gangster, brother. I did movies with them. Like they became. They all became like million dollar phenomenon. You saw Gucci before he became a clone. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely, definitely. The belly. Yeah, we, yes. We know the Gucci man with the stomach. This new Gucci man looking so good, we don't know if that's him or not. Nah, what, that's Gucci. What though. kind of guy is Gucci? But I, I really dig his, his music. Man, Gucci brother. is so, so, um, I can't say I know the new version of him. Right. The old version, he could go from cold to hot. One of those, huh? But he's so funny. He a funny type dude. Not like a funny style, <laughs> but like the shit he say in the studio, the punch lines, you know, just how he. His timing. And then, of course, there's times where he got the dark side Gucci. Just the dark side Gucci right here. Let me get the fuck up out of here right now. <laughs> Why this thing getting on his dark side? That's his mama scared of, he says. Hey, boy. <laughs> so, nah, shout out to Gucci, though. For he sure. definitely, um, he definitely uh, helped me to get my face big down south, so I want to shout him out. Is it a trip now, you know, starting from, you know, making uh, some music at a... At, at a at a theme park, some karaoke stuff, and then now you're at this point. You've worked with Gucci. You worked with some of these huge amigos. You worked with Future. Do you look back and say, "Man, I never thought this was gonna play out this way"? You know, it it was a dream. It was a vision. It was an idea. I thought I'd be bigger by now, but when I look at where I'm at. I say God really blessed me because so Absolutely. many have died, so many have not succeeded. Somebody, so many people lost their passion twenty years ago. So many people gave up uh, because they probably felt like they didn't blow up, or the money didn't come, or the girls didn't come. You know, there's things that we got expectations for as a rapper. You got a couple expectations, but you had to make them expectations. Yes, happen. sir. They're not actually owed to you based on your talent. That's a misconcept. That's a that's a that's a misconcept concept. concept right there, man. Feed, bro. I'm dope, bro. Man, what's up, bro? Why you think? I say, bro, this shit ain't about just about how dope you is. This shit about who ready to go for broke. Mm. See, go, being dope means that you are a fucking powerhouse talent, but you lazy as fuck. You don't work your Instagram. You're not working your YouTube. You're not posting. That's You're not driving and traveling and passing out no flyer. You're not even pursuing this shit. You're not making no film. You're not making no T-shirts, bro. You just a fucking waste of dope ass talent, nigga. You sitting back, and that's a bull. That's bullshit. Right. That's bullshit. Like literally, like if you got it, you gotta find the gas in you to be like, I gotta get up. Let me call somebody, bug somebody, text somebody, DM, post something, shoot a video, do right. a viral, anything to keep you relevant going well i think who who made like a great example of that is like kobe bryant uh michael jordan they were the best in their thing but they became the greatest by going in practicing over and over and over again so that they already seen this play in their head a thousand right. times or they seen this jump shot like i didn't know that's what that that's how they go they remember all them jump shots Steph again? curry like how the hell is his arm he know exactly how how hard his arm supposed to pop to make it go from this 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 spot right here, and he know how to aim it. He know how much to push it up so it can land. Like all of these elements is the same thing. Like 
I caught some buzz when I dropped this compilation. I caught bigger buzz when I paid the YouTube promo ads. 200, I seen my video numbers go up. Uh, I paid the DJ to put me on the mixtape or to play my song at his party, send me the video. That was 250, that was 150. Anything that, God damn it, that is the, the steps necessary because one of them steps could crack open a whole floodgate for you. You paid 150 for something that at the right time, damn boy, everybody just seen that shit. Stuff like that. Like something that don't look like it's as important. Bro, you don't know, bro. That DJ you paid, boy, he played your shit at the right time at the goddamn whoop whoop. You know, at the such and such party. They said, who was that? And they wanted to. Invest they, in yourself. So these elements are step-by-step -step pieces to a, 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 a non-stop investment, bro. It's like a non- I, 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 I would love to be like Future and them where I'm getting paid a million the show and all that. And I used to do, I booked Future for some shows. If you look on my Instagram, you will see a show that on my 40th birthday in, uh, in 2013, I booked Future for my birthday party for 3500 No way. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about it. Nigga, for 3500 and then God damn That's it. That's crazy. Two months later, he wanted 15000 No, now he's going to want half a million. Now, if we was to call him now. <laughs> hey, I got my 50th birthday coming up. It Future might be. Hey, listen. <laughs> he might want the Dubai price. Oh, yeah. That's crazy, you know they, right? You know, they'll go do something for somebody for a million. Yeah, for the birthday. Or for 400000 Or they'll go to this game for three. Yeah. Do two songs. Oh, man. God damn. Literally. literally. So those elements, I still have hope for. That one day, something that I'm doing will cause me to be getting booked for incredible numbers. Or I'm getting booked to talk. I don't know. Shit, they pay uh, how much Elon Musk and them be charging, or how much do Russell Simmons charge to talk, oh, yeah. or how much do Diddy get paid to go talk at Jackson uh, Diddy University? Diddy might be at Rikers like, Island in a few months. I heard about that. <laughs> let's, I heard. Get, let's get into that. Let's go back to Keefe D, homeboy. Tupac. What do you think Keefe D was thinking? To me, it's all about the clout and kind of saying, hey, I killed Pac. And then people saying, no, you didn't. Well, then he just kept going, kept going, kept going. Like So it's like almost like he got tricked, do you think? Something or <laughs> along the lines of that? Well, I think it's more of along the line where he thought he had immunity, which he did for some of it. And then I think clout just took over him as an old guy. Because clout takes over everybody, young, old. And I think eventually he wanted to prove that what his story was true, that his nephew did it, the whole thing, Take because somebody because somebody who somebody who was really a, a killer and was involved, they're not going to talk yeah. about nothing. <laughs> hey, they, they ain't going to talk about nothing, brother. Okay, this is this is a thought, right? For instance, yes, and allegedly, okay, I have talked to guys who've taken lives, right? And according to the streets, the things that were done to them that caused them to take a life, you would say is justifiable, right? In the streets, yeah. In the streets, right? Yeah. But these three guys that verified bodies that I know about, right, that they said, JT, I don't even feel good, bro. Yeah, I bet. And I'm like, but he tried to kill you. I know, bro, but I don't feel good, bro. I thought once I got him, I'd feel better. Yeah, it's not going to cure it. Bro, that blew my mind. And then another dude, they tried to kill him. He got to kill, you know, got to kill right. the guy, right? JT, I, bro, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. Man, this shit bothered me. But they tried to kill you. You got him. It don't feel right, bro. It don't feel good. It don't feel good. So to me, now that's two things. This the third thing that made me be like, boy, I don't know if I want to be no killer. I don't, that's not nothing I'm aiming for. He said, it's a situation happened. He want the revenge for one of our guys, right? right? He get the revenge. He said... Bro, sometime when I be fucking my bitch, 
I see this yeah. nigga face, bro, and my dick goes soft. I'm like, what the fuck is this nigga talking? You see his face? What you mean? Fucking your, what you mean? Bro, I see this nigga face. Damn. Yeah. Like he like the like the dead homie. He's seeing the murder scene or the face. I don't know what the how the fuck he's talking about. He see a face. But the ghost. We thought that that was okay for him to get revenge for our homies. He I didn't tell him to do it. Nobody said do it. But he took it upon himself. But the downside to being the guy who got to, to do the revenge is seeing the dead nigga face while you fucking your girl. Two other niggas talking about, man, I don't feel right, bro. But you, they tried to kill you, but it don't matter, bro. It, I don't feel right. That's three confirmed people who took a life, and it ain't, it ain't the shit I'm hearing on the albums. Exactly. It ain't the shit. So when I see the Keefy D thing, I say, well, what if he do got something to do? I don't know. He talking like he do. Do you think he feel like now he want to give himself up? I think it's like the demon talking to him like, or Pac or something saying, tell on yourself, nigga. I've heard tell that. On yourself, I've heard nigga. that before. Tell on yourself. But I don't think so with Keefy D. Um, Keefy D's, I think, 60 years old. I'm sure Keefy D's done all kind of crazy stuff in his life. And it was almost to me that he was... Like, just wanted people to know. Not for the right reason. If you want somebody to know for the right reasons, you don't write a book, you don't go on Vlad TV, you don't go and do a bunch of interviews for money, because that's what he was doing. He was doing, he was doing like $5,000 an interview, right? Mm -hmm. You don't do that. You go, maybe you go to your priest, pastor, whatever you got, confess to them, and then maybe you go with the lawyer to the, to the police, which he did. He already had that conversation with the cops before he wrote the book. To me, it was that... People started kind of maybe saying, oh, you, no, you didn't. No. And then he started doubling down. No, I did. No, this is what happened. And then he started telling details that the cops and the people that were there were like, dude, this guy knows the details to the T. And so I, details is what confirmed it, basically. Oh, I listen, even with me out here, a lot of people, we've all heard kind of the same story. We've all heard Orlando's name. We all heard, you know, now I'm saying all this because Keith D already put it out there, right? That's exactly yeah. what I heard. So, too. so yeah, it, yeah, everybody in the street, even when I was in jail, bro, we all heard the same exact story, but not exactly what happened. But it was Orlando, you know, Compton Crip, that he got jumped, the whole thing. But when Keefe D came in, Keefe D filled in all the blanks. And I mean all the blanks. But now, I don't know if you've heard that, the original interview he did with the with the Las Vegas Police Department, who retired, he's implementing a. Uh, Puff Daddy. Now, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, you know, because I don't know. I'm just a guy on the outside. Yeah, I, in, I think man. we all kind of are, but we're all kind of like, dude, who confesses? Who who goes and tells them someone a murder? Do you know? I mean, just think about it like this. If that's the case, Puff Daddy in trouble. If that's the case, if they got any kind of money transition, if with it's, it. but guess what? But guess what else? Video out there. The guy who Puff Post gave the money to ran off with the money, didn't give it to him. <laughs> is, that, is that what they're saying? They, boy, well, that's well, a real story. Well, well, that's well, out there. Well, that'll be the greatest money stolen in your life for Puff Daddy. <laughs> because guess what? The money didn't get to you, and I didn't pay for it. And there's no because if if there, oh that could be that's dope right there. If there would if there would have been a, a, a like a transit a transaction in the bank where Keefe D all of a sudden that Got week or money. month deposited five hundred grand in the yeah. Grand, then yeah then he would be screwed. Do you know right now? <clears throat> so if a person solicitate for some murder for a million dollars, I solicit you. Yeah, but I'm gonna give him the money. You do the killing, but he run off with your money. Did I pay you or not? Because I didn't tell you. To, listen, <laughs> <laughs> the money. If they, the got money you never, if they got you on recording, said kill this fool. Here's that's the still money. okay. Yeah. No, but what if the money don't come and he run off with the money? It, it doesn't matter because you, oh, you because man. you you still gave the money with the intention of but getting where somebody is he whacked. Where at though? Well, he's just a dirtbag that took off with the money. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Where is the money, though, that post have been paid? Well, well that, that might clear that will, Puffy that will, that right will be the, That would be the greatest gift Puffy ever got, that they robbed the money. That they robbed the money. Because <laughs> if they can't, if he's he, he talking about Puffy didn't call me back yet. <laughs> Did you see that shit? I seen that say, Puffy didn't call me. Uh, yeah. I'm waiting on, yeah. Keep his but voice. He, that nigga said, Did Puffy call you? 
Oh, what did he say? Did Puffy contact you? Nah, man, I ain't heard from him. <laughs> he need to go and throw a dog a bone or something. It's been 27 years. I still waiting for that half a million, baby. Damn it, man. So I think that's a sign then. That's a that's a cold sign, but, right? No, that's but a cold it, sign it, right it, there. It, 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 but that's the... Is they going to call P. Diddy in the question? I'm I'm sure that he will just he get a... too much money. He got billions. Yeah, but he will still get a, a phone call to, hey, we want to talk to you and just clear this up. Man, he going to take this 400 million. It, it's a murder case. Take this two million. Go on and... Oh, yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't think I don't think they have anything on him. I think I think he'll, he'll be fine. Keefe, I think he well, will... wait a minute. Let's rewind this yeah, shit. Yeah, let's do it. Let's rewind this shit. If Tupac kick Orlando Anderson in the head, yeah, that's the fucking motive right there, nigga. We're doing million dollars. Oh, oh, no, it was well. Keep- or 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 was Orlando Anderson paid to get kicked? No, they come on, there's man. A, there, 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 there's a recording me. when Keefe D said that he was at his had his. I don't know if the hotel room with his homie or they came in and say Orlando got jumped, right? He was with a couple guys from New York as well. These the guys from New York said, "You need some help." He said, "No, I, we got this." They went. Him and the passenger. I, I, I'm not one of his homies. I was in the car. He said, "I got that 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 forty in the in the in the in the car." And when he got the strap, he told, him, "Hey man, we can go ahead and take care of that shit right now for Puff." Because he said they didn't have a clue that Tupac <coughs> was going to be there. He said they would go to all the fights. That was just their thing. And then he's like, "Dude, we got a two for one right now. We'll get our run back and we'll get some money for for killing Tupac." Mm-hmm. So that was maybe their intentions from the seed that got planted mm-hmm. from fucking Puff because they said that Puff in front of a, a whole hotel room full of full of their homies said, "Hey man, I'll give you guys five hundred a million dollars to, to take now off." That sounds crazy right there. Well, that's what he said. Keith, you said that shit too. That sounds crazy because even if you want to kill somebody, like I mean, I ain't never yeah. killed nobody, right? So right. let me clear that up. <laughs> um, but allegedly, I'm thinking, uh, yeah, allegedly, <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. That's cap. Ain't nobody who hired nobody, especially for a million dollars, gonna tell a crowd. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Now I gotta say that. Yeah, no, I get that. Now would now if I told you twenty years ago there's gonna be a guy in twenty years is gonna confess to the Tupac murder that did it, he's gonna write a book about it, he's gonna do all this, what would you say? No. no, no. I would say no, he wouldn't. But there's Keefy D. So <laughs> Keefy D put Puffy name in the book? Uh, I believe so, yeah. He, he, As oh. I got paid, that's the money. He didn't say, <laughs> no, they, I know no, he's, no, he's saying that. <laughs> I'm about to say, hell no. Nah. <laughs> no, he's not recording. He's not recording. He did an interview with the police. Yeah, he did Keefe an interview. Keefe D said yeah, he got a million dollars? No, Keefe D said that, that Puff offered him a million dollars to whack him and and, uh, and uh, Suge Knight. To whack Tupac and Suge Knight. And for a million dollars. For a million dollars. That's that's what Keefe, that's Keefe D's story. I'm not saying it's true. But that's Keefe D's story. Yeah, that sounds... And it's on recording. It's on recording. That it's, sound like, it, that's wow, B. But that's what I'm saying. Who would have thought that, that 27 wild. years ago this fool would sit there and say that to the cops? But it's on recording. Keefe D recorded with the cops who were investigating the Pac murder, and he spilled the beans on everything. And that's after that he did the, the Vlad TV interview. Because why? Because people were, were not, uh, they Aware. weren't believing him. They no, they weren't believe. believing him. So he basically, so this could be, could he be possibly lying and never was in the car? And what if he say, man, think, this all for clout? I think he knew too much. I think he his 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 details were just too spot on. Talking about in the car, but who else could know about the details in the car though? That's just they're all dead. There's three other guys. They're all dead. There was four of them. They're all dead. And hey, Keefe D don't want to lie. Keefe D don't want to lie. Wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Wait a minute. It, it sounds crazy, but that's exactly what it is. Keefe D is the only one alive. All the three other people are dead. Gone. Wait a minute. So he going to jail for what some dead people did? But he was in the car. You know, what, if say, what if he say that he was just playing? That's 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 what I said. My defense would be, hey, I was. Man, this I, is a clout. <laughs> I'm trying to get views, nigga. This is for views. I didn't mean I was in the car for real. Hell nah, nigga. I'm doing this for views. This for my new book, Your Honor. I'm pulling the Charleston White. I'm pulling shit over here. Listen, he in a position to do that right now and say, man, that was for my new book, for my second book coming out. Confessions, com- call confessions. Oh, yeah. well, yeah, but that's what Keefe D's now in uh, Las Vegas uh, County Jail with a million dollar bill. <laughs> well, we wishing Keefe D the best, though. Yeah, pretty because much. Because he not proven guilty. Because I think, what if he got mental health that made him tell, tell that shit and say that? Because that could be something, too. Being a dumbass. <laughs> what, but think about it, dude. Is he in his right mind? 
uh, I because think, he could be going through can, something. Can, if he's sixty, can, shit. Hey, can you can you? It could can, be a big mistake. Can you use saying something? Can you as use a, a defense of uh, I got a I got I got fucking taken over by clout? That would be the first clout defense. Nope. I think <laughs> I think that he can use as a defense that uh, your honor. In today's society, if I say I did it, I can get I can get buku bucks, okay, first and foremost. So let's be clear. And I've been booked up on my little like I've been doing interviews. You think I did it? I'm trying to get no, paid. No, I'm trying to get paid. <laughs> hey, that that's real talk. And we gonna end this, let's end this shit now. I'm a liar. I was just bullshit. <clears throat> I'm trying to get clout. Period. So 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 that's a real defense that you can use and say. The statistics do say clout chasing is an <laughs> epidemic right now. <laughs> this shit for hey, real hey, right so, now. Hey, so so JT, are you saying right here, right now, that you're responsible for Tupac's death? Negative. <laughs> Negative. You don't, you no don't, parts of you it. don't want that clout. No. No. But what if Keefe? Or right, listen. Free Keefe D. I need my shirt, homeboy. What if he doing that for his book and he said, this is to amp my book sales up? That book's like that book's like four years old already, bro. Keefe D was just... <laughs> oh, this shit's talking about... I got a new book coming out where I'm saying that this is part of... Because one thing about it, if they got text messages, phones, and all that or something, maybe they could say, oh, okay, you did... No phones Man, back then. Man, if, if it ain't no fingerprints... No phones back then. Was it fingerprints? No, nah, they got no gun. They got nothing. Okay, so now let's talk he about He got action. Yo, Honor, my new book that's coming out, <laughs> it's going to be something that's so cold because that is how I was going to sell part two. I got Biggie Smalls. Listen, I heard shit. he said something about that too. <laughs> but the good part is he innocent until proven guilty. Abs and, and, so, and, man, in America, keep absolutely. Your D, keep your head up because I don't want to make your situation like my joke, but I want to say that the situation do look crazy as hell. That, <laughs> it does, okay. Because does. most things, like like that killer type of shit, yeah. they never say they be in the car. So that's rule number one. At least one of the rules I know that you never say you was there. No, absolutely not. That, that would be rule. But, but in today's world, things are changing. Things are changing, brother. You and got, that's where I think he got a chance to tell the judge, this is all for my new book, man. And good. I got a DVD coming out. All right, AKVD, uh, let me know when you're ready for the interview. You come out on what we got you. <laughs> nah, real talk. Because this shit for real. Not, like, not, did not, he have mental health? No, nah, no. Nah. Is this a joke? Are these charges real? All of well, these the charges things? are real. The charges are real. That was up in the county jail with a million dollar bail. But I'm saying, though, with no gun, no car, no nothing, just off his words, what Confession. if any motherfucker could say that, though? Yeah, this is true. This is true. What if this he, is come true? Come on, bro, think. No, that, that's my defense. That's a, because look. Man, do you think, Your Honor, his lawyer speaking, do you think my client has just confessed on, on these platforms like that? No way, Your Honor. This was for clout, this was for promotion, for his new album and his new book and his new guy, whatever it is that he's doing. Because it's it like could rap truly music. be, it's like rap music. Like my rap interviews music. is like a goddamn rap song. They talking about they didn't did all this shit and they ain't got nothing. <laughs> now let's talk about something serious. <clears throat> Even though that is serious, right? But let's talk about some that's on the other side of that that spectrum. You, you almost got murdered. Yes. Now, tell me the details. What happened and, uh, you know, how are you still alive over here? Man, only by God's grace and permission. So it was a day in time where you could be helping neighborhoods that you're not from, and that's good. Because anytime I go into anybody else's neighborhood, I feel like I owe that neighborhood in some form or fashion, especially if I got plans on moving around in that neighborhood. So I will always try to do something when they had a little community functions, get the food, uh, hire dudes, hire the mamas when I was doing my promotions, different things of that nature. Well, I have been making movies in this particular project for about three to five years. But one day, one of they big homies say is today I need y'all to rob him. But he didn't want to rob me. He sent his little dudes to rob me. But these are the same little dudes I've been helping and feeding and working Whoa. with, going to studios, doing different and shit. And this is not too long ago. 2017. Yeah, that's pretty recent. Yep. So um, by me showing that love to them all these years, that situation 
made me not cooperate. And not cooperating, most robbers will hit you in the head with the gun or shoot you in the leg to give you a leg check to let you know this is for real. Right. Most robbers won't ask you for the money for 10 or 15 minutes, 10, 12 minutes. They're not gonna ask you. They're gonna hit you with the head. I'm surrounded by all these dudes. Uh, three of them is, is, is participating. It's a group of other guys watching. But I'm just like, today and today, I just didn't feel like And you've man. been here before. I've been in there for three to five years. Oh, dude. It's called betrayal, and it's called, God damn it, eat a man whenever they can eat a man. That go for any hood out here in America. You ain't from here, but it don't matter. They eat you in your own hood, too. But in my particular situation, this is a place where I've been making movies. I've been I've been putting people on, networking, putting them in the studios, feeding the hood. None of that shit mattered on this day because the thirstiness of whatever they thirst was, JT here right now, and we finna rob him. But I just didn't agree. I had a baby the day before. The day that I came, I was going to get a blessing for my baby dropping some food off for some of their poor families that was over there. When I was there, the mothers, the children, the homies, they all outside, it's cool. When I'm walking back to my car, two of the dudes pull up like, oh, two of the guys pull up like, hey man, the big homie say you gotta give us something. And that just was automatically disrespect right there. Like, hey boy, I didn't just fed y'all hood, what you talking about? Ah, the big homie said you gotta give us something. So for 10 minutes, he was making his demand. At a certain point, one of the guys was like, man, I'll pop this nigga, man. I'll pop him anyway. I'm like, oh, shit. It sound like he going to shoot me anyway. So let me just hold on and see what's going to happen. Let me say these prayers right now because these prayers, the only thing I got that I can hold on to right now because I'm not going to get his money up. Because one thing about it, once you get your money up, that don't mean that you soft. But the game I play in Atlanta, if I let this go down, then my face ain't no good ever again of one robbery. So I stood on the business. A few more minutes went by, the shots start flying. Shit. Draco bullets. But with God's blessing over me, his shots wasn't connecting good. So I took three, leg, the body, one right here, skin in my face when I try to block the shots. Cause you know when, when somebody trying to shoot you, you gonna automatically do mm -hmm. this. You ain't gonna do this. <laughs> you definitely gonna do this. That thing flew by my face, 7.62. That right there was a, a, a situation that is something I've been anticipating for years because I'm in too many hoods and I'm with too many gang members and one day everybody not going to love me. Somebody going to have to try me. But I made my mind up. I ain't going out like that, not, not on that day. I wasn't going back to tell my wife and my babies that I just got robbed. Imagine I got shot and they got so spooked, I can only say God got in them. Made them run off and get to get the money. My mans told me that still was fucking with them, say, Fee, you know, you got shot because you didn't cooperate. <laughs> I said, I know. He said, yeah, they had to shoot you because you can't buck a nigga like that in their projects, bro. Like they big homie gave an order, so he had to do it. That's why they didn't finish you like they could have finished you. But I say, shit, my prayers got me through that because he definitely was, should have oh, yeah. finished me. You didn't already hit me right here, hit me right here. You thought that motherfucker caught my chest or something, but it didn't. And then you you didn't finish it. You're supposed to make sure my body ain't moving. The real killers put one more in your face or your head or something to make sure, okay, he ain't coming back. It's over. You know what I mean? So. That's just a blessing in another a street experience. Like, I've been in the gutter. I've been in the trenches. The shit ain't easy. It's always a nigga that love you, and then he could plot on you. It's somebody that could hug you. Somebody that could eat with you. Somebody could, you could, they could meet your mama, mm -hmm. your children. They could be hanging out with you in the family at the park. Same motherfucker, boy, I'll try your ass, and it's up to you how you going to uh, deal with it. Uh, Betrayal. Uh, 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 apart from... <laughs> Just the the pain you must be going through sitting in the in the hospital bed and going you know through all your recovery. How was your mental your mental you know your it's thinking about damn I'm I'm trying to feed these players man I'm trying to help these guys out. Guess what I was thinking when I woke up from the uh, operation. A few days went by. I needed another operation. 
My homeboy came in the room, seen hella blood on my stomach. I was leaking. He said, hey, man, my partner leaking. Woo, woo. The nurses run up in there. They got to do emergency surgery. In the procedure of them doing, doing emergency surgery, they tell my partner, get out the room. You got to work on them right here, right now. We can't even move them to the, the operating room. We got to do it right here. They start talking about sutures and what needle to use and what thread to tie me up and shit. But meanwhile, this lady got her hand inside my guts, right? She got another lady holding the camera. Because these are students. Some of these people in this room are students to see how do you deal with a situation like this. So they got a film, right? I say, man, give me my phone. So I can film this shit too. <laughs> Fuck you mean. <laughs> Fuck you mean. <laughs> So I can oh. film my surgery too. Oh, shit, I'm JT. so because if I'm not dead, and I don't know if I'm finna die or not, I don't know what's the outcome. I want my family to see how I was in this bitch standing tall. To you feel me? They got their hands in my guts. They giving me some shots called Dilaudid. I'm taking morphine. They got this button. I'm pushing that motherfucker. Why? They got their hands in my guts. This whole thing is open. But to me. Off all this dope, I was all right. <laughs> I was off all these drugs. Listen, you squeezing buttons and shit dripping and surgery. That was my moment of if I lived through this little next surgery, this is a whole nother surgery that I wasn't even anticipating. That's when I knew if I ain't dying right now, man, I'm finna I'm finna use this as a moment in time that I'm gonna capture this, my real pain, to show for entertainment purposes and for learning purposes. Young nigga, keep playing with them guns if you want to. You might not be lucky waking up from no fucking surgery. I got hit with a Draco point blank in my stomach, boy. It went through my body, boy. Then I got hit in the leg. That bitch broke my whole femur bone right here, boy. I got a metal rod in my leg, boy. You wanna keep playing out here, boy? I had a shootout before that. I shot a motherfucker in front of my building. The shooting is something that they came, and it's a shootout. Right. But then I get shot. A whole nother shootout, different one. That didn't go good for me on that one. You ain't going to win them all. So that that's the reality. Like, I always tell the people, like, man, I've never been a gangster. The stuff that I've been pulled into were things that was out of my control. It wasn't in my control. It was something being pushed upon me that made me have to react in a way where, damn, uh, I don't have a choice. You know, I didn't sign up for this shit to be having to do this, but I definitely signed up to know this might be required. Right. This your survival, and it's a jungle, and all that positivity shit. That's cool. You'll get your noodles knocked out. Street you'll the streets. Get, you'll get your positive noodles knocked out because this is not a game out here. So you're going to have to bring some type of animal with you to come amongst these animals or stay your ass away from them because you don't know what day somebody going to try you, play you. You've been feeding them. You've been helping them. Imagine that's why they say never bring nobody to your house. That Because th that person, it can be it can be detrimental to you and your family. It can be that one. Because people, you don't know their loyalty. We was just bros. We've been working together. We've been working on the podcast, man. We've been, and then it's some backdoor shit. Yes, sir. Like, 100%. damn, bro, hell nah, man. I've been fucking with Feed, man, and goddamn it, JT then came around, man, and goddamn, you know, hundred percent. Because we got a good vibe, but imagine it's the door that betrayal walked through. Is right. this type of vibe of of, of camaraderie? Up, this type of camaraderie, this type of communication, our understanding of how we interacted and what we trying to display for the people. So they could see this good conversation. And it's a real reality of how do you predict a back door from somebody you trust? The betrayal don't come from people across town. It come from the one you trust. How do you weigh and measure a person? How do you weigh and measure that? Because that is some of the things that I, I say, was I bad at judging? Should I should have known that these niggas was hating? After even though I did all what I did, nah, bro, you can't you can't calculate that. I put in good seeds over here. I'm expecting good seeds coming back. Nah, not necessarily so, sir. 
This the real streets, boy. This shit cut though. That's what they mean by cut though. Right. Somebody you trust. Imagine I'm in their project. I'm surrounded. They could have just jumped me and took everything from me. Yeah. This one about jumping you, homie. This about respect. Wow. This about we want your manhood. That little nigga needed to get his man. Your manhood. When they say get on the ground, feed, you supposed to got on the ground. Well, shit, as a man, I just felt like, and shout out to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He said, if you're going to die, die on your feet like a man. Yes, sir. Because you only got one life to give. So all that getting on your knees, begging somebody for your life, that's not necessarily so. Now, after that situation, did it make you not, or did you completely stop like going and helping communities and doing that stuff? It slowed me down. It made me reevaluate how to go about doing that work. It made me focus on bringing people, if I'm going to do it, have me some shooters on deck. Right. But if I got to go somewhere where I got to have shooters on deck, then maybe I shouldn't be there. <laughs> yeah, you ain't there for a peaceful process. That's not it. But even going into a peaceful place, it could turn into a deadly a deadly operation yeah, very sure. quickly. So um, formulating the blueprint of how do you help your people uh, and, and where should you help your people? Like how, which neighborhood is the best neighborhood or where... You know, um, well, JT, you shouldn't go over there. Them people evil. Well, that's where I should go. Well, JT, you shouldn't be over there. Them folks is, them is the places I really loved it to go because that's where I was able to do the work that I got to do. So um, it made me value myself more, and it made me more stingy with myself. Absolutely. Um, the random pull up on the block and hang out for an hour or two, that's not the blueprint for me. I'm like, shit, I'm more valuable now. I got to play my shit more smoother. That means I don't have a party life now. I don't have a club life where I be going clubbing and all that. Nope, I haven't done it. I was in Africa three years. I just got back and been back for 10 months. In these 10 months, I've been to probably two events, maybe. That's it. Talk to me about Africa. What how, what did that come about for you living out there? And how much did that you know change you spiritually? You know what? Um, I'm... I went to Africa the first time ever is in 2007 with Snoop Dogg to Lagos, Nigeria. Um, he brought me there. Uh, he had a show with Beyonce and Jay-Z. Um, that's my first experience. Ten years later, 2017, I get invited to Burkina Faso, Ouagadougou, West Oakland. I mean, uh, West Oakland, West Africa. Um I like what I see. I build a water well in the name of my mother. She's still alive. Shout out to Mama Pearl. Say, I'm going to do something good for my mama. These people need this water. That was my re-evaluating or, or uh, that's my re-evaluation of looking at Africa as a potential place to network with and to become part of, to interact with. By 2019, I moved back to Africa. This time I'm moving for good. <clears throat> sell the house, sell the car, sell everything. I'm out of here. I'm going to Africa. I'm putting everything. I'm betting the whole bag on Africa. Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso, 21 million population, French-speaking country, very difficult to communicate and do business, easy to help and participate with, <clears throat> um, they needed water so I built another water well I purchased nine and a half acres of land I built a small house out of mud and bricks that experience just gave me my my stripes as Filmo Africa I'm from Filmo so I planted my flag over there Filmo Africa I lived in a village and I lived in the city <clears throat> that experience showed me extreme poverty and the appreciation of running water, electricity, uh, modern, modern, modern uh, furniture and doors and bathrooms and um, the culture and the experience of seeing people that's poor but living in peace and happy. Seeing a family with so little, having dinner tonight 
with all of them, the man, the woman, the children, and they all gathered around, and they look more happier than the black community than somebody with a big ass house and got two big cars in the front, or uh, everybody eating in their own room, ain't no prayer, ain't nobody hugging, nobody. Right. It's like, it's a family, they love each other, but it's like, it ain't like the African family where they sitting down and the dad helping and the, the kids and like. The tradition. The tradition of family in the African culture that's crazy that I'm from America and that's the part that we lost. Our black community, we lost like the family love part. We got family love, but it's not as popular. For those who have family love, they're lucky. Some of us have a family and none of us talk to each other hardly or we don't fuck with each other. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like blood that don't matter. <clears throat> so, um, for me to help them people, that was a big part of my mission. How many people could I feed? For two hundred dollars, I could feed two hundred and fifty people right now a meal for two hundred and fifty dollars. Man, let me buy this store out again for two hundred and fifty. Matter of fact, I got five hundred. Then I got people in America. JT, I got a thousand. I got five hundred. Next thing you know, I done bought out ten stores. I got a whole street full of people following me. Best feeling in the world. I said, oh, this God work right here. I feel like Muhammad Ali, but I know it's only God because they didn't kill me. Right. I got a pocket full of money. I'm in this bitch by myself. I'm in some of the most dangerous hoods in Burkina Faso, Karmpala. I'm in Nairobi, Kenya, Babindogo, Kibera, uh, 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 Kangami. These are places of extreme poverty. Where you walk in there, boy, <laughs> and I filmed some of my best footage is me walking through that bitch and got all the killers walking with me. They're like, man, this guy, he love our people. You a different kind of black American. You are over here buying out stores. You building water wells, and you not charging us money? Hell no. Nah, I'm trying to get a blessing from God. I want the, I want the big God to bless me. Now, how much does, <laughs> Straight up. does, you, does your faith have to do with you? Doing That's all, right? all my faith. Man, listen, when you, when, you, when you pray to God in whatever name, you understand him, right? And then you start making proper changes to adjust your life. And then you start seeing results of your prayer. You can clearly tie your results to your prayer and your actions of correction. So paying it forward... Greed, if you can be, if you can be protected from your own greed, you will have the chance to do, to be great. Because greed could choke out your greatness. And you will forget about being great and go for, for the greed. Like, if you add any part of you and say, man, God has blessed me to make some progress right now. I got plenty enough where I could slice out something that I could drop off at Skid Row or over here where they suffering. Or, you know what I mean? So I think paying it forward was like part of my faith. I don't know these people. What the hell I'm over here spending my money and I got a wife and kids. And I got a mom at home that needs shit too. Why would I care about some poor Africans? First of all, I live here. Second of all, I got way more money than everybody around here right now. And I do feel like I'm supposed to do this because I don't know how long I'm going to be here and they don't know when the next time they, they might not never see me again, but they're going to remember the black American who came over here and was buying out the stove for two years straight in one country. This man coming over here buying out the stove. That little bit of money that did so much, I'm like, man... Imagine if I was spending 10000 on food. I could be feeding 10000 or 15000 people with 10000 And with 10000 you're supposed to get bulk rate. So that means I should be able to feed 20000 or 30000 because if I'm going to the manufacturer for the cornmeal, for the, for the rice and all that, man, boy, you're going to give us some truckloads. I'm not paying the retail price. I'm going to pay the wholesale price. So I learned about wholesale and resale. The farmers is my folks. The stove man want his money. 
So if you buy it from a stove, but if you get a plug with the farmer. <laughs> we're back to the dope game. <laughs> now we back to the dope we're game. We're back to the dope game. I'm talking about see. mangoes, apples, onions. I'm talking about, man, a truckload of dirt was going for $450. Of some particular dirt. It's very fine. It's very smooth. <laughs> $450. All they do is drive to this place. It's an open field. They get the dirt and then they drive it all the way back to the city. $450. Now, if I would have bought the truck, hired the driver, I could have been busting down $450 per load just off one truck that's going to do that at least three, four, five, maybe times in one day. Because some construction company, they need this for more cement. This sand mm, right here, yes, what it was. The product. Me, yes, this red sand cost this much. This brown <laughs> sand cost this much. When I bought my land, I'm like, well, what the hell dirt I got? Because <laughs> this unlimited, you could keep digging, and you never gonna dig up the earth. What's uh one misconception you think people that don't know you, uh, JT, about you? Mm. A misconception about me right now, I think, is they think I'm broke and that I need to steal money or something. Or or how does he come up with these things and the misconception? There's no way that he thought of that on his own. And there's no way that, you know what I mean? Yes, like, for sure. So, so when people hear that, some people grab that and they just take it. Oh, JT, they say you, you stole something or you... Well, where's the receipt? Don't go by accusations, man. Where, where's the fucking victims at? Where's the crime? And that is something that I think the only thing to clear that up right now is the ultimate success that I've been looking for since I've been in the game for 31 years, and that's the hit like I ain't never hit before. And from there, when you got ultimate success, you can say whatever you want about whatever. That boy hit for the money on his own off what he did. My money didn't come based off somebody else. My money came off an idea, whether I sold my catalog, trap flicks, you feel me? Like the thing that is the ultimate success, ultimate success. After a 30 some year career, you could say I could qualify to retire right now. I enjoy seeing Snoop Dogg and Ice Cube, Too Short, E-40, my elders. And I said, well, that, that 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 could be me, possibly, potentially. Then I thought about it. I'm about to be 50 years old, God willing, in about five weeks. So I said, I need to, I need to wrap this, this wrap thing up and put a pen in it because I want to be a software developer now. <laughs> you, you're gonna get future you're gonna get future for a 50 at this time. <laughs> He might want $5 million right now. Oh, man. I ain't no telling. So, last question. In in 20 years, 30 years, when they're looking back at the history of hip-hop and uh, and your name is mentioned, what do you want them to remember you as? I want them to remember me as... as the guy that gave himself and sacrificed himself for everybody else to get the blueprints. Whether I get my recognition now or not, it don't matter. But all these years later, I want him to say, dude, never held back the info. <laughs> he the only one that didn't care. He told the people the real info that the big boys use, and he lived it, achieving the success of whatever level I could. But others have took the same info and went further with it. You were not a gatekeeper. Nope. The boy, man, that man was a pioneer that showed people how to do things. Regular people. You don't got to be a rapper to do some of these things. Yes, sir. If you pay attention to the independent game, it's a God-given talent that you utilize to get what you want. And with that, JT, man, I, I appreciate you and your boy coming through, man. This was a great just all-around experience for myself, just, you know, going back in time and history and, in time, and, and, and learning your and learning your story, man. But you can go ahead, look at the camera there, let people know where to find you, and uh, send the hate mail to, homeboy. Hey, listen, 
Tap in with me right now. I want y'all to download my app called Trap Flicks, man. It's in the iOS store. It's in the Google Play store. Hit me at JT the Bigger Figure Instagram. Hit my DM. Tap in with me. Let me know what you thought about this interview. Salute to American Cholo, man. And that's the move. That's it, baby. Hey, man. Thank you guys so much for tapping in on this incredible interview man thank you guys for bringing us into your home and just you know sharing sharing and uh liking subscribing all right we're out salute good shit that's man. good shit good hey listen good this shit. motherfucker got a, a, a cold vibe to this one <laughs> this one this one feel more like a human being